I knew you'd be an interesting person to talk to. Look at the number of books behind you versus the number oh, of books behind me. <laughs> that's a, honestly, that's about one tenth of what's behind me. Oh my god! <laughs> what is it mostly? <laughs> and they're nearly all geology books and surveying books. <laughs> geology. Yeah. Yeah. So I, there's also I, I usually speak to tradesmen, and I'm a little bit like uh, I, I have a, an opinion like university and. Uh, exam results don't really matter unless you're quite academic and you're going to do something in the and i've got a feeling that's you <laughs> you're the unless yes <laughs> um it's really funny having come online and just started tiktok as a almost as an experiment to start with because yeah. i had there i had formulated why i was actually there originally <laughs> no one knows or what i was doing but um, it's so funny when people just don't actually understand what a real expert is, and they can't <laughs> recognise what a real expert is online at all. Of course all. you can. Someone with loads of followers on TikTok. Exactly. And that is massive part of the problem um, that I sort of suddenly realised of seeing all these people giving advice. And I thought, well, I'm currently being sued for a million quid for advice that I gave. Now, any one of these people who are giving advice, so they're giving advice which could cause an injury, potentially. Yeah. You know, someone saying, well, use this paving and someone trips over. Um, and do they have professional indemnity insurance to give the advice that they're giving? So they could lose their livelihoods, a lot of these people. Yeah. And they don't even realize that, for starters. Um, yeah. We'll it's get into quite... that. We'll get into that. Um, so... I literally, I've just been. I've been in the house about two minutes. Did you have to rush back as well? Oh uh, yes, yeah. so I went out, did this job at the most amazing, almost like stately home place, uh, looking at the roof. And then I had so many different people ringing me at different times. Just you know how life is. And yeah, you're just thinking, okay. Then I had a puncture on the way back, so I had <laughs> to get to the place and sort that out. It was just a typical day. It seemed, you know, yeah. just mad. That's, Everything goes um, wrong. And then people look at me and go, well, here I am abseiling down buildings. How do you remain so calm? It's usually because I can ignore everything when I'm up there other yeah. than what's in front of me. Yeah. And you get the most serene feeling when you are dangling 100 feet above the ground below, the world's going by, and you just, I'm in my own little world. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, there's a lot to be said for that, isn't there? But you, you haven't got your phone on you. There's nobody bothering oh, you. Well, might be there doing those TikTok videos. Oh, yeah, you have got your phone on you. <laughs> But I do ignore it. If someone rings, it, I mean, it, wait until I get to the ground. But that's the great thing about uh, I've always got that excuse. I'm abseiling sort of sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, I'll ask you about that in a bit. So I really appreciate you coming on because to me, you're really, really interesting. And I don't really know. Um, we, we technically shouldn't cross paths. You're a geologist. I'm a chancer working in the tiling world. Um <laughs> But it's TikTok, in it? So we'll, we'll explain why that happened. So yeah. TikTok algorithm decided to put you into the tiling and landscaping world. You didn't try to get in it. The, the algorithm just decided no, to put you there. I, I had a big hit on one of the things to do with tiling, mm -hmm. that one with you know, do, using the flame um, process. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is I, I have done loads and loads of tile investigations internally, externally, all, all types of building investigations I've ended up doing over the years. And for a time, I was um, sort of, when the NHBC, you know, the National Home House Building Lot, um, had disputes and they couldn't resolve them or not, they got to a point where they didn't know what to do. I used to be the person that came in on their behalf, mm -hmm. on everyone's behalf, really, but they were the ones who brought me in. Um, to try and resolve the disputes. And in the end, I think they stopped bringing me in because I nearly 99 times out of 100 always went with the complainant because if something's wrong, something's wrong. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And the builders are usually trying to work their way out so of it. That, that's interesting. So to, to tilers and builders, that'll be really interesting because 
when they get investigated, it's usually by the manufacturer. Yeah. And what a lot of people think is, I have to be careful now because I said something on the last episode or the one before that, and I'm like, shit, people are complaining and investigating me for saying something, that I, my opinion. But so what tradesmen might think is when the manufacturer investigates it, they've got no intention at all of finding out what the truth was. Their only um, goal is to yeah. find a reason that it's not their fault. <laughs> the other thing is that if they do recognise it's their fault, then they're looking for the quickest and cheapest way out of it as well. Yeah. Which is not always the best case scenario. In many instances, you've got to do a whole range of things. And, and it's usually just skin deep what many people will do to try and think, oh, yeah, that looks good enough. And yeah. you could say that about most of the installations on TikTok when people are showing what they've done when it's finished. Yeah. All looks lovely. But I keep saying, well, where is it five years down the line, 10 years down the line? How good yeah. is it going to be then? That's my job to kind of predict these things. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get to all of that because I've got loads of questions for you. But if you can briefly introduce yourself um, to anybody listening, so, so who you are and what you do on a day to day, and we'll get to why I found you and invited you on uh, when we get to the social media. Yeah. Bits. Okay, so my name is Barry Hunt. I'm a geologist by training who became a chartered surveyor and got a few other qualifications along the way from effectively being in the building industry for over 40 years now. And a lot of that time investigating why things went wrong with many different types of construction. And I worked for two internationally renowned um, testing houses that also had consultancies attached to them, which I used to kind of go between the testing and the consultancies. Um, ended up doing works on so many major structures, amazing client base, I have to say, that I've got over the years. Um, these days, I have the contract for surveying buildings like the, the Bank of England, for example, which you see probably on quite a few of my uh, TikTok videos that I've done over the last uh, year or so, showing little bits of architecture as well. But I do many, many different properties. And yes, I can label people like Roman Abramovich, um, the Queen, when she was the Queen, because I work for her, not the King as he is now. Um, yeah, the Crown Estate, I've done many different jobs over the years for oh. some big corporations I could name, but I won't. Um, <laughs> yeah, the list does go on and on and on. Because I deal mostly with natural stone, and stone is a high-end, high-value product. Yeah. So when something goes wrong with it, it becomes a big deal. It always becomes a big deal. Yeah. And that's the industry I've been working in is a very, very high end industry. Um, and this is where I sort of decided in my mind that I wanted to try and give back to the industry. Now I'm sort of towards the end of my career in a way that actually helps the domestic market because they don't have anyone really supporting them. All the consultants don't want to give their secrets away. And I've been publishing stuff for years and years and years in uh, trade magazines, lots of articles on stone and stone problems or the way that it's best to build with things. And I have so much information to try and put out there. But as yet, loads of people don't really understand what I'm doing, why I'm here and the information I'm giving, how good the information is and how yeah. useful it is yeah. because it's swallowed in amongst all of the crap that's out there. Yeah. What's happening is so you're, to me, you're great. So you would you would be like, um, and you do present it in this way. Actually, you might be the kind of um, entertainment because that's what I see social media as that you would find on the Discovery Channel or uh, Channel yeah. Four documentary or something. The, the way that you present it because you're an ex you are an expert and it's a scientific approach that you take to it. But you're in the world of social media, and it's fine. I think that should exist in social media as well but you're swimming with people who've got massive followings and and they're trusted as being experts and they might be but they didn't get the following by presenting things in a scientific way they got the following by yes. i don't know having an argument with someone or doing a funny video or something that's um snappy for social media so you're bumping in 
I've to be honest, a lot of your the comments on your stuff is positive because people you found a following and, and people like me are like this is fucking brilliant. But I think you do get a bit of people saying like who are you? Like, are you even a tradesman and things like that? Yes, I've had that. Is oh, clearly there's so many as they call you know Google experts and stuff. Yeah. It, it's funny because actually that's one reason why I started my live Tuesday show. So every Tuesday, 6.45, I do an hour or so online answering any questions. People can see me there showing stuff down the microscope or I have the books. You can see all the books behind me. They can see me not typing away into Google, for starters. They can ask me almost anything they like and I will just answer straight away. And they can go and check if they want to on Google or wherever. And I would say 99 times out of 100, I'm correct. And even when they go to Google, they don't. Google doesn't have the bigger expert picture. And I had someone yesterday who was trying to claim I was more a roofer than a geologist, you know, because I was talking about slate and the Oxford English Dictionary. He said says this about what a slate is, and, but <laughs> things aren't that black and white. And I've had to argue these sorts of questions in court. So I know that yes, slate might be given as being a fine grained. Uh, metamorphic rock in the Oxford English Dictionary, but to the trade, it's any material that can be used for roofing purposes that can be split quite thinly, that's a roofing slate, then that's the British kind of example. But if you go to China, you can have all sorts of other types of materials that could be used for roofing slate or be classed as slate. And that happens all over the world. Just because you've got one definition doesn't mean to say you're right. Yeah. And yeah. there are accepted geological definitions, there's accepted engineering definitions, and that's where all the confusion can happen. And yeah. I'll always try and knock people back and say, think bigger. <laughs> You've got to think bigger. You've the, got to look at the um, the legal you know. approach to answering questions that would be fine in court <laughs> might be tricky on TikTok. Absolutely. So. And that's the thing, is no one has that level of i would say thinking on tiktok at all about every issue that i look at and the way that i present it yeah it's got that background in my head of why yeah. i'm saying it there are always yeah. many more reasons why if you think about it though i think it's it's changing a bit now it's it's moving on from from this but the tiktok audience generally speaking should all be quite impatient because they're used to 15 seconds or 30 second entertainment yeah. so you you you're all it's not everybody obviously but your audience is and i'm not speaking about anybody in particular i'm just talking about social media audience in general they're developing from having zero attention span and tiktok is doing it you do get longer form tiktoks now they're yeah. developing away from it so you're in the middle of you're going to be part of that development you're going to help uh, uh, um a little bit a platform like tiktok to get people used to a two-hour conversation with an expert or a little mini documentary to and absorb it rather yeah. than flicking through crazy things and that the, the more um viral type things so, oh yes um my stuff is never gonna go viral ever because it's not designed to my, I want to try and get to this magical 10,000 followers, which, you know, I've got to close to 6,000 now, so I'm getting yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. The only reason I want to get there is so I can organize my TikTok so I can have things on, say, stones. Like, this is all your explanation of stone types. Oh. Then, here you go. This is all your explanation of what you can do with this particular type of stone. If you say, if you were thinking about swimming pools, mm -hmm. for example, then oh, that will then list a whole load of TikToks, which will have Hopefully, this is what you do with this type yeah. of stone or that type of stone or this situation this is what you want to do. So it becomes actually a source of information with easy to understand sort of bite sizes of information. Yeah. If you notice, all my TikToks are basically one minute and two seconds long. Um, if you look at them and analyze them, they're nearly all within one minute and two, one minute, five seconds long, just about there. Because it's trying to get across just one or two very, very sort of strong points in a format that is very, I hope, easy to understand. I'm trying to explain some really quite difficult scientific stuff that we've worked out over the years of, you know, just doing the job and investigations and trying to make it so that people can understand. Because if you don't make them understand, then you've lost it at yeah. that point. 
the whole point of it is lost if you yeah. don't get the communication across. But my goal is not to make money to have loads and loads, thousands upon thousands of people viewing my videos because there's something funny there or, you know, look at this, look at that. I want people to just think of my place as a resource. Mm -hmm. And I've, I'm lucky enough in my job and the way that I've worked through my life that I don't have to worry about income. All this is just being done free and I'm giving consultancy advice every Tuesday free, which I could charge, you know, my clients if I was charging that time for quite a few hundred quid an hour that my rates could go. At. I just don't need to make money from TikTok for one second. Yeah. Um, it's my way of giving back, as I say, this huge amount of information I've accrued yeah. over years and years and years of working in an industry that I absolutely love that's given me a great life. Yeah. And um, that's the reason I'm doing it, which is definitely different to most people. Do you know what will happen with that attitude? You'll start making money from TikTok. <laughs> you will. But honestly, if I did, I'd probably end up just sticking it all, honestly, into... Uh, I've got... There's a couple of charities of mine. My my sister um, died when I was sort of eight years old, and she was in Great Ormond Street Hospital. So I tend to put an awful lot of money that way. And wow. there's a couple of other things um, in life as well. So yeah, I think you know, be, if I, I did, think you could because I think your the way TikTok's going, the, what you've just explained might not be exactly what it becomes, but your you have a, your channel is a channel. You know, you'd go to Sky. And there'd be or Netflix or whatever, and there'd be an yeah. app on your Amazon stick, and your app is I don't know a specific type of TV, and you click on it like I don't know Sport Channel for example, and you know there's going to be a lot of sports there. You that's your channel on TikTok. Uh, yeah. Stone and geology and uh, history. Absolutely. It's the history that gets me with you, because I'm I'm into <laughs> history. So sometimes you you do a bit of history with it. I don't. I think you might do it without realizing. But yeah, it's trying to get a little mixture of things that are of interest in one hit. With, as I say, almost hidden in there, but it will go in there somewhere of critical bits of information. Mm -hmm. But it's making them just a bit more. As I say, there's the bit of entertainment there with some of the bits that I do. But again, I'm not trying to be super funny i'm always got a smile on my face and there's always a couple of subtle little quips in there or something going on in there um if you ever listen to the music that i always put with my tiktoks which i put barely audible but i mean i just did one on pulling out a small tree and i had uh, the hanging tree in the background <laughs> that's, that's too clever there that's too there's clever. always a little things like that dotted in amongst I'll them. have a listen next time because I try and do things like that as well but I'm not as clever as that I'm far uh, far less subtle than that I just bang it in basically there's me hanging off a building pulling a tree out <laughs> so the hanging tree was going to be the right thing you know yeah. it's, it's just that it's simplistic but I'm, I'm always waiting for people to pick up on those little things you yeah. know yeah <laughs> right. that take multiple watches though so you might get that in the future yeah, maybe. If they know I'm doing it, then they'll maybe uh, they'll start sort of trying to look out for those. Oh, well, things. I will now, definitely. <laughs> so, is London where you're based? Because that's where a lot of your work is, isn't it? Yes, yes, in East London, and a great place to be. And is that where you grew up? No, um, I grew up in, I'll say Croydon. Everyone has heard of Croydon. <laughs> Right. Um, just up the, the North Downs, just outside of Croydon, just head, as you head south, um, a little village called Wallingham, right on the border of London, basically. And it was a, a very nice, easy childhood, I'd say. A typical, you know, I was born in 65, so I'm very, very the first of Gen X. And I did have that feral childhood. My mother used to literally from about the age of eight or nine, I'd disappear sometimes for days. And she just said, <laughs> I don't mind what happens as long as you come back alive. And that was kind of my upbringing. Uh, that's good. Um, you know, I have a South African mother who had traveled the world and she was fairly kind of very easy with an awful lot of situations. So yeah. shall we say? You know. Yeah, it was easier back um, then though. I think people are a bit too oh. paranoid these days because I don't know if I mean, it's more again, dangerous or people are just more aware. I try to explain to my son, I mean, he's now 25, and um, just the crazy stuff that we used to get up to, 
you know, and most people just wouldn't bat an eyelid then to stuff that everyone's screaming and shouting about these days. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to explain that generational thing of what we got up to. Yeah. Well, you're you're like the generation before me, and I and I could explain stories like that where I disappeared for a day mm. or whatever. I mean, mom and dad were like, whatever. We got no <laughs> idea where I am. I could have been yeah. literally anywhere. I used to drive. <laughs> I would go out on my bike, and we could be twenty miles away, and I'm ten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 the occasions when the the, the police call your parents, and that's the ones yeah. to. <laughs> to yeah. avoid as often as possible but that has that did happen quite a few times in my early life you know but you yeah. just it was all what i call innocent fun yeah rather than anything you know more than that you'd be borrowing a mate's motorbike and riding it the wrong way around the local village green or something and yeah. the local bobby would be trying to catch you, you know? yeah in those days we didn't have anything like the the problems with the traffic of course as well you yeah know, yeah yeah life was a lot easier in in general it was more chilled certainly i would imagine Definitely. oh yeah, yeah yeah what about family i know you just mentioned your sister yes uh so i actually have two sisters and a brother um fairly one of those families that we almost don't speak to each other, but we're very close. We will bend over backwards for each other. We could tr we try and kill each other regularly. We, as I grew up um, south of Croydon, just into the countryside there. Great fun with uh, two sisters and a brother. My eldest sister, as I say, died when uh, I was eight years old. She was five years older than me. And that, that hit the family really hard. And I think that's what drew us all together as a family for and we still are very much supportive of each other. But at the same time, you know, we can go months almost without talking to each other as well. And you know, my brother is a total nightmare. and I'll, I'll, He knows he's a total nightmare. Um, but he's, uh, you know, I, again, no matter what trouble he gets into, I'll always bend over backwards to try and help him, bail him out, whatever it takes, really. Yeah. Um, but that's what so, families should do, you know? Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, sorry to hear about your sister. It's horrible, young age. Do, do you mind? Uh, yes, it? Uh, it was one of those situations where she had childhood sort of multiple sclerosis and in a really bad way. And, and at that time, they weren't able to diagnose that type of condition. And you know, she was a sort of researched at Great Ormond Street Hospital. And it was only about ten years after her death, or even later, that uh, they worked out what was actually wrong with her. Um, yeah, it was uh, an interesting, sort of tough way to be, you know, as a young child growing up with an older sister like yeah. that. So horrible. I yeah. think I think about my kids because my kids are about that age that you would have been. I can't mm. imagine like something like that happening. I saw um, a six-year-old at his mum's uh, yeah. funeral and things like that. I'm like, well, yeah, I don't know what I'd do. I mean, it's made me very accepting of all these things of, you know, what life is all about. When you have that early on, I, I think anyone should be the same. And you're accepting people obviously come and go for all sorts of reasons. And whilst you are clearly, you know, it was very upsetting. I lost my father a year ago this week. Uh, but he managed to just about make it almost to 93. And he had a good life. And, you know, he was absolutely 100% you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go, you know, about 10 years ago. And he was almost biding his time. He said, well, I've done everything I wanted to do. He was very happy. He was just like just waiting, just waiting, going, you know, I'm ready. Just let me go kind of thing. Um, but regardless of that attitude, which we both really have, it still hits you yeah. in the heart. Yeah. Yeah. I honestly, I don't think you can explain to people because I don't know what I'd do. Especially for kids, it's worse with kids. It's hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh, yes. I mean, any parent should love their kids and therefore, as I'm the same with Cameron, extremely protective in certain ways. Even though he's grown up to be a real tough cookie, a very intelligent tough cookie as well. And, uh, How old you know, is he? He's 25 now. So uh, not a kid? Not a kid anymore, but he'll always be, you know, my my my, my son, my yeah. lad. Still daft, um, still not there yet. <laughs> you know, and we're all proud of our kids, and I'm very proud of him in all sorts of ways. You know, there's nothing I will ever say against him because he's 
you know, done so brilliantly, really, in uh, life so far. So, yeah. Cool. So did you always live in that area? Is that where you grew up? Um, so I grew up, basically, I was actually born in Reading, the most boring place in the universe, I believe. <laughs> I but it, thankfully, I, I, I left there when I was three. But I still support Reading as a football team. That's all right. Someone has to. Well, it's good. You you have to support where you're from, don't you? I'm a Stoke yeah. fan. Not a lot I can do about it. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's a case of I've always got my idea. I can't really go over and see the football so much. And I, I fell out of love with the game a few years ago. I just got bored with all the... What I could just call cheating, you know, yeah. they're all cheats. Yeah. Game these days, and I'm just bored, bored with it. I like the rugby a lot more these days. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I was built for rugby myself. So. <laughs> it, it is a better setup. I'm always jealous of rugby because I do, I do watch it, but not like eagerly. I, and I'm jealous of I the setup and the and the attitudes and ev- the fans, everything. Yeah. I just wish it was. I wish everything about it, it is superior to football. Now I'm sorry, football guys, but you know, I used <laughs> to love football, but. You know, over rugby, but I've come full circle now, and I'm total, totally into the rugby. Yeah, it's so I could really get into the football cheating stuff because I, I talk about it a lot with my friends, and I'm the kind of person who will Google stuff and then quote facts and figures and things. And it's like the Man City thing and what Chelsea are up to, and they're, they're like the worst examples. But even the lower yeah. down, what Birmingham are doing in League One now is like, what, what are you doing? But I don't talk about it on the podcast now because I've got all this information. I'm like, I'd have to fact check myself first and then talk about it. Yeah. Because I'm like, I can't, I've just realised I, I, I can only say certain things. Yeah. So school wise, uh, that what? Yeah. What? I was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not diagnosed at all, but I know a couple of psychologists and other people, and. They just say you have the worst case of ADHD near enough. Really? You know, one of the just the way that I am with so many things and the way that my mind works, which yeah. is quite different to most people, the way I look at situations and work things out. Yeah. But I spent most of my life outside the headmaster's office. Um, I just couldn't sit still. I could not concentrate because I was bored, because everything was too easy for me. But ultimately, that meant I actually struggled with exams. I couldn't do um, the written exams very well. My English was terrible, really terrible. And so actually doing exams was really bad for me. So I kind of managed to scrape through without any effort whatsoever. And I was happy with that. And I did that in you know both junior, senior schools and then got into university, did exactly the same there. Yeah. And... When I left university at that and started work, I actually switched and I got, I already had a work ethic because I was working on building sites from the age of 13. I had um, landscaping kind of gardening jobs at four different places that I did at the weekends and some some evenings. I was doing three paper rounds in the morning um, and I would do weekend paper rounds for other people as well. And I was always the cover. And it, I used to run the paper rounds because I would like to, just keeping fit from the running yeah. side of things and running obviously with two bags on me as well <laughs> so i was fairly fit young man um i grew up at the time of moon landings you know in 69 i was four years old so i started collecting gemstones and a whole range of things and thinking about I always wanted to be an astronaut so I sort of had also clever enough to realise it was never going to happen anyway because astronauts were all from the USAF and how was I going to get into the USAF? And except, you know, to anyone who's got any sort of brain, you're thinking at that time there's no chance. And, of course, they stopped going to the moon, um, you know, when I was nine, ten years old. And the space programme had just died out. But it still didn't stop me. And I got to university, went through that, and I did the geology and astronomy together with geology finishing off in the final year to getting my degree in geology, but I was actually better at the astronomy because I found it fascinating. Then, you know, I got to look at some moon rocks and all manner of stuff. I did a project on the fretted terrain of Mars, um, looking at rock glaciers and all manner of other features there, which prove the presence of water. And that was back in 1986. I was sort of saying, well, there's clearly evidence of water on Mars for all these reasons. (laughs) 
Viking images that I'd been given, all these Viking images to look at and pour over. And What's relate a Viking to... image? Um, so the Viking landers that went to Mars, the very first sort of proper um, space vehicles that travel to Mars. Right. There were a couple of other missions to Mars. I was before thinking them, about but they Vikings. Were <laughs> yeah, so you have to look up Viking 1 and Viking 2. Yeah. Um, and they sent back really the first sort of detailed images of Martian surfaces. Mm. And there's this area called Alba Patera, which has this uh, particular feature called the fretted terrain. And that's where we found all these rock glaciers and other interesting features, which we could relate to certain things on Earth and how they had to have you know, moisture involved in their formation. So, yeah, it's, uh, that was a really interesting time. And I, I, I turned down an internship at Houston because I was young and naive and I didn't realize that when they said, oh, yes, and of course, it's an internship. I said, yeah, yeah, said, well, what's an internship? And then they said, well, you won't get paid. <laughs> I was, and I, I didn't really have much money then. Not 86, 87 was when the miners' strike was still on. I was in Sheffield, yeah. in amongst all the miners. I was out raising money for charity. I was chairman of the RAG committee, and uh, there was one event I put on in 1986, which we called the Pajama Jump. And in one evening, I raised £60,000 for charity. What's the RAG committee? Uh, the hmm? What's the RAG committee? Oh, so that was really what was, it was just all fun and pranks. And just you spend a week organizing events to try and raise money for charities. So we'd have all sorts of sponsored things. But the idea was just to, um, you're supposed to dress in rags or just, just be sort of generally crazy for a week and just do what you like. Huh. Um, I dressed as a woman for most of the week. <laughs> Can't imagine that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got a lot of looks oh, roaming that's around. Normal, me, yeah, that's just normal. I was roaming around town in a nightgown, and that was very strange. But then I had bleached punk hair, which was down beyond here. So I got a few cat calls from behind, but it was a bit of a frightening sight <laughs> when I turned around. Yeah, so I experienced uh, that uh, miners' strike period. So my, yeah, my dad was a miner strike. at the time. Oh, okay. So I, it was uh, yeah. really, really tough to see it from, as I say, being in Sheffield through the whole of the strike yeah. near enough. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it, we worked hard at trying to help a lot of families at yeah. that time. So yeah. that put me in good stead, definitely with the work ethic I already had, but just the way I look at a lot of situations when people are moaning, it's like, you don't know the half of it. Yeah. You know, what people moan about these days is just, yeah, whatever. Yeah. That's not me now. Cause it's hard to explain to kids, but and I don't really try and say it this way, but my the kids, like my kids versus me when I was their age, they haven't got a clue how lucky they are. Even if they had less than what they've got, they still would yeah. be really lucky because it was that period of time in the 80s. And I, I went through the 70s with the three-day week and the yeah. power cuts and all that sort yeah. of stuff. I still remember all of those things yeah. as well. Yeah. You know. um, yeah, I just think today, the amount of moaning that goes on over nothing, sorry, but it's just, I just don't care, you know, when people are like that. Somewhat. Yeah, social media has a lot to do with it as well. I mean, there's lots of good things about social media, but there's lots of bad as well, because it just magnifies everything, doesn't it? So someone's, yeah. someone's complaining, whereas and when social media didn't exist, somebody might say, I don't like fucking Tesco or whatever. Now they've got 10,000 people who will agree with them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so whatever you put on, it could be anything. The school's crap, or the well, taxi, I, whatever. I really love it when people try to troll me because I'm literally immune. But I will always, I'll just pick on one person every day who they troll me and I'll start answering back and I'll just take it to the nth degree of insults usually or something <laughs> without being insulting. You know, yeah. the, just the, the trying with the humor to just try and bring them around from like, don't be a troll really. Yeah, yeah. You know, so let's, let's try and see if we can spin this around. Some people I've spun around and actually end up having really good dialogues with. Yeah. It is best um, to be nice. Because, it's best to be nice back because yeah. I don't know what it is about social media when people decide to be mean. I had a few, but I, I think they don't realize I really don't give a fuck. I've experienced way worse yeah. than, than what they can do. So <laughs> I would get things like they take it, the piss out of your appearance or whatever but i love it i was pissing myself like yeah. loving it and there's people trying to defend you and i it's fine. i really don't care I just i'd like to speak to this person who's doing this just to see what they're like well one of my posts just prior to the election was that 
I was fed up putting the post out and you get 100 people or whatever, you know, going boat reform. You know, it was just all that was <laughs> happening at that time. So I found out the way to avoid that from your comments and other things. And I put in all the markers there and did a little post on how to avoid all the, what I said were the reform bots. But in actual fact, yes, I picked them out as an example, but I did everyone. I did not just reform. I did conservatives, Labour, you know, every party, except for, you know, in the past, yes, I have voted for Monster Raving Looney because I just don't care about yeah. politics for yeah. one second. Yeah. But I had over a thousand comments you know on that one post people you know i'm in this echo chamber and doing no, it again. Yeah. they just didn't understand the fact that you yeah. know i'm just telling people just we don't want this politics here. yeah you have to be careful i hate what politics is now i do because yeah. it's like choose a team and I no matter what the other team yeah whatever it doesn't matter you have to pick a side yeah. now Pick a side, and you agree with everything they say, and you have to disagree with everything the other side say, and that's nope. it. So nope. if you if you sit in the middle, so I I often get this. So I fell out with my friends because of this, and it was I think it might have been when Boris Johnson was um, that election when he won. Yeah. And I wasn't particularly taking sides because I, I genuinely don't vote. I don't give a fuck. Don't want to. Don't care because it's yeah. In my particular area, it's pretty obvious. You'll get in every time, whatever. So I was trying to have a normal... We shouldn't really talk about politics because it always turns into a shit show. But I was trying to have a, a normal conversation by saying, what about... It was Jeremy Corbyn at the time, wasn't it? So people who didn't like Jeremy Corbyn really fucking didn't like Jeremy Corbyn. And people who didn't like Johnson didn't... And then the opposite, people who loved him, really loved him, and the same for John, Boris Johnson. Yeah. So I was trying... I always do this. I would be sitting somewhere in the middle saying, well... Can't remember exactly now. It was a good long time ago. Do these ideas are good that people would call communism or whatever. But and but also these ideas are good. What some what people would now call far right. But yeah. you can't do that because then both sides hate you. And so I was being I, accused of both being right wing and left wing. Yeah. <laughs> so I uh, said to someone the other day. I said I don't actually believe in this left and right no, thing no. because. It's more like a massive circle with so many different offshoots in different directions as to that, you know, it's not really there's a left and a right because there's so many different types of views and opinions. But it's very, very lazy of the media and very easy for people to label stuff that way. Yeah, it also uh, depends where you sit. If you're, if you're like, if you're in the far left, like, echo chamber... Well, Anything, yeah. anything right is far right. So even centred politics would be far right to those people. I mean, because anyone who wants to discuss politics with me, I always warn them. I said, I'm, first and foremost, <laughs> I'm not in the slightest bit interested, although at the end of the day, they, they affect you in various ways. And I do have opinions. But all I will ever do in any conversation in relation to politics is take the piss, Where, whoever it is. <laughs> I just can't, because I can't take it seriously, yeah, ever. It doesn't yeah. matter who it is, I just can't take it seriously. You're right, though. It's not real, is it? It's a game that pol yeah. politicians play the politics game. So, it's me, not, it's they don't care about anything. It's mostly a waste of time if you just made your mind up already as to what you're doing. Yeah. The rest of it is just pointless. But, yeah, I voted. I always want to use my vote, because I think that's important from a historical point of view of mm -hmm. the fight to Vote. so from that point of view you could say i'm a bit of a socialist <laughs> um but at the same time i've run you know businesses for myself i've used the system in various ways legally i have to say um but people would say then surely i would be nice and right wing because of being you know very much a capitalist in some respects but these as you say they're all bits bits of your own personality yeah. are in all different areas and yeah. i have no allegiance to anyone whatsoever other than um, expect if you if you do have an allegiance to someone, I will rip you to shreds with taking the piss yeah. because I can't can't avoid it. You got to I to be honest, you, you you've got to be insane to yeah. to, to have an allegiance to to, to a politician because they <laughs> wouldn't piss on you if you're on fire. None of them. Oh, I know, I know. They do it's... not care. I can't think of a. Anyway. Scene. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. But I can't think of one off the top of my head. Anyway, yeah, yeah let's not talk politics. Let's move on for politics. You you got to um. <laughs> uh, you're at university, so if you struggled with exams, because yeah. we talked about exams and um, kids being labelled as naughty 
on the yes. on the last with the last guest. Um, and I did bring up actually ADHD because it could it could especially in the past it could have been uh, it, they just call it autism now, but Asperger's ADHD autism, somewhere yeah, on the scale different labels. Yeah. yeah, and it's like in the past you were just naughty. <laughs> and you couldn't do exams. And I, even kids who, who aren't on that scale, they may not be very good at exams for whatever reason. And I, my argument always is that we need a different way of educating those kids. They you can't Absolutely. force them to remember some questions and then get some grades that mean they can go to a certain university or whatever. And it means nothing. Exams are, mean nothing to me. But So my question to you is, if you were struggling with exams, how did, which university did you get into and, and how? Well... I'll just quickly say that this is why I do those TikToks the way that I do them. As I say, it's my way. I I think the way my ADHD works, as I say, I'm not diagnosed, but 100% believe that I'm well, well and truly on some end of some spectrum somewhere anyway. <laughs> um, that's a beautiful way to learn. It's always this visual stuff with little keys. And as I say, there's all sorts of subtle stuff there just going on in the background to help people to try and remember because it's the way that I learned always was observation and sort of taking things on board. I just couldn't sit down and read books. I find fiction is so dull. doesn't matter how good a book t- I've tried and I just, I just can't take fiction whatsoever. I just don't think the stories are that imaginative, no matter how well-constructed people think they are and how classic they are. What goes on in my head is just like, yeah, whatever. It's just not interesting. (laughs) There's nothing there that I find interesting in any fiction whatsoever. Uh, My head is just, as I'm talking to people, I'll be thinking of something over there, something going on over there. There'll be other things I'm thinking about in the back of my head. And I'll be, you'll be talking to me and you you would suddenly realize that I'm not taking the slightest bit of notice that you, although I'm (laughs) doing responses. And, you know, I'll forget things almost instantly. And six months later, I'll remember everything from that conversation. (laughs) Bizarrely. Have have you ever, have you ever, I know you said you've got psychologist friends, but have you ever thought about speaking to an expert to get some kind of diagnosis? Because it sounds like maybe you could get one. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there, there are certain people including my wife that's going you should just get yourself sorted out and um you know i said to her Look, i've reached yeah next year i'm 60 most mm-hmm. people don't realize how old i am yeah because of the Surpri- stuff that I get surprising. Up. yeah um and i said you know i'm just going to carry on being who i am as long as i can just acting i say like most guys i'm still very much embedded in my teenage self yeah with the way i like to approach things with a you know fu- what i call a fun heart mm-hmm. um you know mischief always is lurking there as well but yeah. it, it's difficult to get through a professional life sometimes with all of that yeah but um with regards to the qualifications going back to that um yes i got all the standard stuff i got my maths physics didn't do chemistry i wasn't uh, allowed to do chemistry <laughs> for reasons you might be able to guess because i just kept setting things on fire i kept <laughs> making explosives i was one of the times the police returned me to my mother was because i had blown something up um and there was something that blew up that was in the local papers as well yeah um we uh, used to make smoke bombs and cause general havoc all over the place and that's me. You give me half an opportunity. Sounds like you were good mis- at chemistry. Well, that's the problem. It was the mischief. I was like, I learned all the chemistry, but they, they just banned me from the chemistry lab because I was just a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I follow someone on TikTok actually that's really good. So he's, he's a, I presume he's chemistry, or he's a chemist or something, but he's a yeah. young lad and he does really like complicated um, chemical reactions and explains really well. But he okay. speaks the way that he speaks. You would not expect from a, someone who's really good at chemistry. He speaks. I don't know how to say this without being um, uh, without sounding without it sounding bad. So he's from London. Yeah. And he speaks a little bit like you know the London. Um, oh, I don't know how to say it without being without sounding bad. You know, have you, have you seen? Have you seen uh, Top Boy? I'm what? thinking of the chav or something like that. Or... Not a chav, but it's like the, the there's an accent in London that's part yardy, part there's, English. Um, yeah, and it's got a state, bit of everything in it. State, the sort of 
gutter so, estate language that some people talk about. Or yeah, that's what I didn't want I mean, to say. <laughs> but I that, know, but so he speaks was, like I, that, but he's a brilliant. He's brilliant at chemistry, so he's really interesting yeah. to follow. I mean, I, I knew that because I used to hang around Croydon all the time, and then, then just used to come into London and spent time in places like wonderful places like Thorns and Heath and Brixton. I mean, I was there in the Brixton riots as well. Um, which most people probably don't know or remember unless you're my sort of age. Uh, yeah, I mean, and I've learned over the years to, how should we say, just talk a little bit more, <laughs> less <laughs> well, like for me, you know, sort yeah, of. I don't care how people talk. Heavy type it, of person, it doesn't matter. I don't care at the end if, of the day. It depends where you're from, doesn't it? Wherever you're yeah. from, if that's, if that's how you picked up, if that's how you speak and... Things change. I mean, the dictionary changes constantly, see, I, so it's like, I don't mind. I temper my language only because I'm trying to explain stuff and because I want people to learn and to, to get on board with uh, certain things that I'm saying. So yeah. if I came out with all the sort of expletives I would like to use sometimes, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't get anywhere because people would get offended or we, we think yeah. so. You know, you learn over the years, okay, I can't really speak like that. <laughs> how to handle certain situations but you know the friends and that it's just you go back to natural speaking and you know to be you always have to put a face on unfortunately for sort of dealing with other people yeah and, especially uh, especially with work we talked about it I, it's it's the, yeah, cor it's the corporate stuff as, it's like fucking hell yeah i, can't do I still it. try to be as much of myself and when you see me in my post especially when i'm abseiling down the building that is me. That is me just being enthusiastic about what I'm doing. I'm in my element at that moment in time, for sure. You know, I'm dangling on the rope, so it's dangerous from that point of view. And just think, there's lots of things. You'll see, I'm always looking around as well. If you spot, yeah, I might be talking to camera, but you'll see my eyes darting. They're looking at the building. They're looking yeah. at the safety see, up there. Or when when there. you're up, so that's a lot of your TikToks, right? So for people listening who've, who've never seen you before, your TikTok's the stone guru. Is that right? Yes. So I, you're always up a building every other every other post, really. So what are you actually doing up there? So a lot of that's just uh, looking at the condition of buildings. So someone's got to do it. Bits fall off buildings all the time. And natural stone in particular weathers over time. Many historic structures have been there you know, hundreds of years sometimes, several hundreds of years. And things are quietly happening, which no one's looking at until you get there. And... There are buildings that I have had huge, great big pieces of masonry come away in my hands. Really? And incredible that more people aren't injured or killed by falling masonry because it happens all the time. And a lot of my stuff reacts to pieces that have fallen off buildings. I've been involved in the investigation of a death from falling masonry in one instance. There was another one where I almost hit by falling masonry. I was looking at a cornice I moved away from it and was had filmed it. A lady came along with a push chair. It was about half an hour later, but we were still around. And just the point where I was standing, she pushed the push chair over that point, and this whole masonry came crashing down behind her, missed her by about half a second. And they had that on camera. I can't tell you where that was, but it that sort of stuff happens. Um, was it Gordon Kay, the actor from Hello, Hello? He was hit by some falling stone cladding. Really? Um, in high wind and that's what gave him that slight brain damage i believe or whatever it is but don't quote me on that <laughs> um but yeah he was injured quite badly by some falling cladding you see. and it happens all the time um if buildings aren't maintained properly and looked at regularly and that's what i promote is yeah. every five years you should survey these major buildings to check that they're okay yeah. simple as and use that to in reduce your insurance premiums yeah if you're having your building checked then the insurers should reduce your premiums to pay for your surveys, at least. So you're going up to look for known damage and also just to go and have a look because it's that time of year and, it, and they have it done regularly. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm trying to promote in the industry generally. But yeah, with churches, they already have this quinquennial um, surveys. Every five years, someone comes around and just goes through a checklist and looks at the masonry, looks at all the other things, and just makes sure what needs to be done over the next however long to ensure that the whole thing stays you know, intact. And why don't we have that for our major buildings, you know, any building really? We should be doing the same thing. And it's not that difficult to just go out, even with a pair of binoculars once a year, and have a quick look at 
things. So see that, if someone that's not paid. even that's not even written into law that you have to check. No, no, there's nothing there whatsoever. Wow. So it's yeah, any heart. So many buildings. So it's so, a knee jerk reaction when something falls off. Yeah. So any building, any height, any age, you don't have to check it. No, there's no wow. actual requirement. So where checks tend to come in is that you'll get these big buildings, say office buildings, and someone's then leased that out or there's a rental period. And as part of that whole lease that they've taken on board will be something like uh, you've got to put everything back as it was when you took the building on. So you have to have these checks on the masonry and everything else and do repairs if they need to be done. So there are things there in contract sort of law, um, but that's between individual parties and how they write those things up. Wow. But so yeah, otherwise... No one ever looks at their buildings until it's too late, usually. Yeah, that's mad, isn't it? Well, the crazy thing is you could have a piece of lead work, for example, on a building which just develops a tiny little split in that lead work. Now, that lead work's there to protect and help water run off from that building and manage it and push it either towards a drain or off the edge of the building and just to fall away somewhere. So that crack develops and you get water coming in and then it goes in under the lead and the lead itself stops that masonry from drying out because it's a protective cover elsewhere beside it so the masonry gets saturated you then get frosts and that starts to then deteriorate the masonry far more rapidly you'll get other things like discoloration because the water's hanging around and it mobilizes stuff inside the materials so you get a series of knock-on effects of darkening of the masonry it becomes more and more discolored maybe dirt gets in and that stains it more and more as well but it's all breaking down out of sight, quietly underneath the lead. And then all of a sudden, a great big chunk will fall off in a big frost because it then splits and it's been weakened over time. And it's so usually at that point which someone interjects and goes, oh, my God, something's fallen off the building. <laughs> Rather than 20 years earlier, if they'd spotted the split in that lead, that would have been an easy repair at that time versus maybe £20,000 worth of masonry to suddenly be done to repair what's happened because of that little fault that appeared. Yeah. Or a court case one because is, someone's dead. Or that, that will cost you these days about 25 million quid for an inquiry. If someone dies in those circumstances, <sighs> the ensuing inquiries and all the investigations that will happen will end up, I believe, around about £25 million being spent on that. There you go. That's your liability. Most liabilities don't even cover that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the risk so many people are taking, especially with a lot of big buildings, is the liability is quite enormous. No one ever th really thinks about the, the values until it's too late. Yeah, just hope for the best. Yeah. They are good old so, buildings, though, I suppose. They built well. Yeah. Every building's got its problems, but... Many of them are easy to resolve, and there's lots of simple things. And that's what I try and promote is simple, um, quite positive action, regular positive action yeah. to have little expense now to save on huge expense later. Yeah. Very simple. How old is the Bank of England? Um, that was uh, basically oh, John Soane was the architect for that, and a lot of it was built in the back end of the 18th century. So we're talking, because it's, it was a big building, so it took a number of years. Um, certain elements, were it were built at different times as well. So we're into the sort of 1780s, 1790s. Some bits were built in sort of 1800s. Yeah. Um, but then there was a complete redevelopment of all the internal areas, and that happened between the 1920s to 1940s. Um, that was Henry Baker, who was the architect for all of the remodeling. Uh, very, very fascinating building. I mean, the amazing history uh, attached around it. And, of course, all the, uh, the stuff that goes on inside it, there's quite a history there. <laughs> and uh, there's a museum attached to the Bank of History that's well worth going to and seeing. And uh, there were two Roman mosaics that were sort of found when they were doing the foundations oh. of the building. Actually, there's three in total now. Um, one was shipped off to one of the museums, another museum, there's one that's with the museum tour, and there's another one that's in the bank that if you go in, if you're working in the bank, there's a staircase which you can go down, and it's at the bottom of this staircase, and that's the one I did a post on. In yeah. fact, wow. About probably a year ago, I suppose, now. Wow. Uh, just amazing bits of old Roman London that are knocking around. And there's many others around London, of course, that they keep discovering more and more. Yeah, so you know those Love buildings? It. So it's most of the buildings that I see you on. 
that I, I always look at them. They're obviously they're amazing buildings, and 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 it's like common knowledge that buildings used to be built better than than they're built uh, yeah. in modern times. So the question is: so when say the Bank of England or any building that's like an amazing old three four hundred year old building or whatever. Would they, at the time, I presume it was in a very expensive way of building it at, at the time. It would be now, obviously, but it's the reason we don't do it now isn't just the cost, is it? No, it's the loss of skills. Yeah. And yes, in, in back in the day, you know, there were so many more stonemasons available and yeah. applying that sort of trade to put up structures like that. Yeah. Um, the wars, the First World War and the Second World War decimated the stone industry in particular. Uh, the younger men, obviously, many of those that were fighting fit were people like Masons who were very fit guys already. And the quarrying industry was the same. So it was at all parts of the stone industry from the quarrying through to processing through to the masonry side and the building side. Uh, so many men were lost and those skills were lost. Yeah. Massively lost in skills and numbers of people. And with the new sort of idea of concrete coming through and that style of building and making quick, cheap, prefabricated stuff after the Second World War, then suddenly the need for doing good stone masonry was just out the window. We weren't repairing and thinking about our heritage so much then as well. Everything was about, um, you know, the, looking forward with the Festival of Britain in uh, 1951 with this whole kind of let's move forwards from here now attitude that they had looking at new materials the new designs the brutalism of concrete that came in at that time um all this rack concrete that we have that's the kind of a back end of all of that sort of construction of simplicity using concrete basic materials um in ways that i like that style quick. do you like that style i quite like the brutalism and like i square. love it yeah i have been to a lot of communist countries um and to look at a lot of the brutalist things i was in, actually i was traveling in uh, russia well really as it was the soviet union back in 1986 87 i was there um the first time and it was brilliant being in proper soviet uh, russia <laughs> at the time I've, i visited uzbekistan and tajikistan and other yeah. sort of satellite states at that time and you know, we were followed by the KGB or other local agents. And you know, I was sporting a proper punk, uh, almost Mohican style uh, haircut at the time with a few colors in it. It was, it was great. Why I mean, were you I there? Try to... What were you doing? I uh, just wanted to travel. It was because um, Aeroflot, you know, the national airline, we're doing flights there. So we caught flights there and just decided to travel around and do um, <laughs> a bunch of sightseeing. <laughs> Yeah. I was still a student at the time, just at the back end of yeah. my time as a student. Closest I've so, been to that would be Poland. And that was that was strange, actually. Yeah. And I'm not talking about the big cities, so I would travel to factories when I was working um, for... Where was I at the time? I was When I was working at Sumitomo, so their factories were in, like, uh, what's it called? Rotswav and Lejno. Oh, uh, Rocklab, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't even know how you say it. So it, it's spelt like W-R-C. It's, it doesn't yeah. look like it sounds at all. But um, I remember thinking then, fuck, where I'm standing, I, I liked it because I love that simple, blocky mm. uh, architecture. But I could literally yeah. be standing in the middle of like a war film or something. <laughs> That's what it looked like. And that was like modern <laughs> Poland. Yeah. So, I've yeah. been, yeah, I've been to quite a lot of the satellite areas of uh, the former Soviet Union and visited, you know, we don't. I, I don't you know, I say we don't because it's my wife and I and my son has been involved in a lot of the travel over the recent years. We love going to former submarine factories and all oh. sorts of stuff like that. Uh -huh. You know, we, when we go and travel, there's always a, a background of, you know, you go to Yugoslavia or the former Yugoslavia, <laughs> you know, um, they have all the things like the Spominics, which are these weird and wonderful statuette things that you get all over the country of these amazing designs in concrete and some crazy memorials that they put up. And this happened through most of the Soviet Union. It was just absolutely brilliant uh, place to go and visit back in the day, as they say. But a lot yeah. of this stuff is getting lost or wiped out. I have books called, there's a, a couple of books called um, 
bus stops of the Soviet Union. You know, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever come across those, but they're brilliant. They're amazing designs of bus stops in concrete. But, you know, someone has compiled things like this. But when you put them all together, you think, wow. The, the imagination of people, yeah. and that's what I like. About you don't it. get it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get it basically. now. I don't know if you would in the Soci in the Soviet Union or Russia, but <laughs> you don't get individual designs anymore. Like that. That's Not a little bit so what much, I was getting at no. with the buildings. They're always like, well, a computer's put the something post together. I did a couple of days ago, I did a post which I'm talking about Faience, which is this glazed yeah, 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 terracotta. Yeah. yeah. And it's in an Art Deco style, but a lot of people didn't realise that building, I only just found out, is only six, seven years old. And it won some design awards. And I think rightly so, because oh, really? it went back to those much more classical lines and yeah. thoughts. Although inside it's working as a modern building, everything on the outside smacked of the Art Deco or no modern way. you know, type of So that, that's just design. proved my point i just made completely wrong because i was i was going to ask you questions about so if they tried to make a modern building in the old style because yeah. of the material costs i presume they were expensive yeah. back in the day but they'd be horrendous now just because of sourcing it as a problem and then the skills well, involved how what's that building that you're talking about with the faience so that building um it's one that uh, the designer Alexander McQueen is in. So people are constantly going by and photographing it because, as I say, I believe it did win awards. I've got to look some more into it. But I spotted in the depths of the garage there that um, they had some of the blocks of the faience. Now, these blocks are like huge chunks of ceramic, giant things. They probably weigh several hundred kilograms each. So when you look at that building, that's not a tile that's on there. Those are giant masonry blocks in ceramic that are there. Have all been sort of locked together and built, so they clearly did spend a few pennies on that building. Yeah, to, but that's what happens when you spend the money. You get a building that looks fantastic. Yeah, the detail that they've gone to, the way that everything's set out there. To me, the skills involved in doing that building were close to what we've seen in the past. Mm -hmm. I could still pick holes in some of the jointing and the other things, which would have been better, I would say, back in the day. But <laughs> it's. You just look at the overall effect, and most people wouldn't give a stuff about whether it's a six millimeter or a ten millimeter joint that's there, yeah. or the type of mortar that they've put in there. It just looks great. It yeah. did look great. I mean, I thought this is a stunningly beautiful building. So simple, but uh, why can't we do more of that? And yeah. you know, I'm glad there are still people willing to do that. Who owns, but it's rare. Who it's owns rare. the building? Why is why was it so? Why, would they, why did they spend so much on well, it? Well, I wasn't actually surveying that building, although it was part of the complex yeah. I was looking at. You just so, scooted over a little bit. I remember the video, you were like, look at this one. I'm not look, I'm not on this building, but look at this building. Yeah. yeah. But while I'm there, I'm not going to throw <laughs> down the, just miss the opportunity to go, look at this. It's yeah. just beautiful. Yeah. You know, absolutely stunning looking building. If wow. you like that stuff, many people might not like the stuff, but to me, the, the way the materials have been used. And that's my passion. Um mm -hmm. You know, as I say, a geologist first and foremost, I love, you know, for my sins, I love rocks. But geology is not about rocks. Geology is the, is the jack of all trades science. It's the science of biology, chemistry, physics. You've got to do a certain bit of maths. It's all the sciences rocked into one. And then you've got to think about things in a historical context, going back way beyond archaeology, that you're going back millions to billions of years in how the earth Form, but then you've got to think about the planets as well and all of the other things out there that are happening that come together. Yeah. So you've got to have a bit of everything to go and go, okay, I've got a fossil here and what's that come from? Where did it go? From? What does that relate to in the timeline? And that will give you an idea of the type of environment that was there. And there are meant so many little clues that you are picking up on, subtle stuff that that's the geological training. So when I look at a, a rock, I'm not looking at a rock. I'm looking at sometimes thinking thinking about the, the fossils, the life that was in there, the, the environment that was there, and that time, the whole setting of that particular bit. To me, that rock has got such a story in it that I'm not even thinking of it as a rock. I'm just thinking of it as a bit of history with all that science and everything yeah. that was going on. Yeah. That would be brilliant to have so, the knowledge. Because I often look at things, cause I haven't got the knowledge you've got, but I often look at things. I would even stand, so we went to a, a castle, or, and it was like some some forest surrounding the castle. 
So, I, so I'm standing in a forest with like trees that have probably been there for a fucking thousand years or whatever, thinking yeah. someone else has stood here a thousand years ago. I'm like, so what? But to have your knowledge as well, I could stand there and think, oh, this is exactly what happened a thousand years ago where I was standing now. <laughs> But I think about well, the people like there was someone just like me was standing here, I'm probably dead by now. I was fucking. But it would be great to know more. I can't walk up a road anywhere really. Um, I, I did a post on the Sleevely Cliffs. I had not read about the geology at all before I went there, so it was interesting just walking up the road. And it's like, oh, here's some rocks. These are schists, and then I, I'm explaining as I go along. <laughs> oh, here we've got some bended rocks. These are nices. Um, and just introducing it in that simple way. So if someone else has ever seen my post and is walking up the road, they'll go, oh, here's the schist, there's the nice. And then and sort of eventually I want all my posts to slowly build up with that information of, well, a nice is this type of rock which has quartz yeah, or yeah. these minerals in it. If you're using it for, you know, a paving or whatever you might be using it for, then eventually I want to explain why it might be good or bad in certain situations so that they seen the rock over here they've then learned a little bit about it and now here we are using it and maybe understanding why it's not great to use in that particular situation that's how i'm slowly building all this sort of background knowledge in all of my posts there is a sort of bigger plan eventually but it, it involves potentially something like a thousand to two thousand posts to bring all of the picture together as i say i can't do that unless i get to the ten thousand followers on yeah. tiktok oh, you'll, you'll get there easily it you only I'm, need what one more viral post and you'll blow past 10,000. <laughs> you will get as one say, as well. It doesn't really go viral because it's very information. You'll get one. You'll definitely nice. you'll you'll do one by accident. You'll you'll <laughs> hit on a piece of history that's just like fascinating and you you talk you, know, you talk about too much interesting stuff. You'll get something by accident, I can guarantee the, you. The thing that frustrates me about TikTok, well, probably with all of them. I mean, I post my stuff on Instagram just to, I just thought, well, I'll just throw it somewhere else as well, but I don't even try the slices with instagram and that's done absolutely nothing with my posts whatsoever <clears throat> nothing nothing happens no likes no anything it just sort of it's there in the ether so tiktok works to a certain degree but sometimes i put a post out and i think well i've just had in 15 minutes you know close to a thousand views and a hundred something likes and anything and then it just stops tiktok seems to yeah, stop it yeah it's random it's like, well clearly a good proportion of people like that and then yeah. It's yeah. like it's been switched off. It's very thinking, random. I'm actually, I'm actually giving out what I call sound information. I, every bit of information that I give, I'm very committed to making sure that I think I've got my facts right, first and foremost, that through all those years of knowledge, and that there is a point to it, ultimately, that I'm trying to give away good knowledge that will help people you know, build a, a pool or they want to do an internal floor. What's the best material to use if, in a particular situation i want to be able to answer all those questions eventually and people can come on my live and ask me that right now if they want to yeah and they could end up with all the answers they need to know if they're thinking of buying a bit of stone as to how good or bad it may be yeah. the one message i'm trying to get across more than any other but i'm just falling on deaf ears is the whole um child labor and slave labor in in, in india that's been occurring for a yeah. few years yeah. which is a topic I would love to somehow put enough pressure on government to get them to ban the import of those materials until they sort themselves out. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's any excuse anymore. There's lots of people say, oh, yeah, but we've got these people to pay for the kids to go to school and that, but they're not there 24-7. And the reports from the United Nations, from people who are doing the investigation, say it's all a smokescreen. They've just, it's a cycle of debt that they've got these families into. And Something like 20,000 people die every year in Rajasthan from the quarrying industry with silicosis and really nasty diseases. And the kids that are, are down to five years old um, that are working in these quarries. There's meant to be something like 300,000 children working in um, effectively a poverty of uh, yeah. this cycle of yeah. slave that, labor. That's in multiple industries as well. So I've got, I don't know as much as you about it. I'm going to ask you some questions about it, but I've got some experience where. So I won't name names because I'll get in trouble again, but so-called big companies yeah. have got these um, rules and regulations for sourcing because I was always a buyer. And you had to uh, do proper uh, investigations into a particular supplier to see 
have they got the background and where do they source their materials from and they, they would always get around it that because you can't accept child labor technically for the company that you're working for so it just doesn't say child labor on the paperwork but it's still there yeah it's just it's hidden there. behind like say smoke and mirrors and it's just amazing how apathetic most people are because there are so many companies especially on tiktok every landscape you see it seems oh look at this indian stone and i'm doing indian stone because it's the buzz thing from everyone's selling it because it's cheap and stone is not a cheap material it should never be a cheap material but people are sold the idea by the likes of certain big broadcasting corporations maybe uh, with this here we come and do your garden we do this and here's some lovely stone and they're mm. all at it you know how yeah. nice does this look so they sell you the idea that you want to have stone because it's a desirable material beautiful material but traditionally it's always cost you money yeah the only reason you're buying or able to buy cheap stone and therefore get that paving done for this price is because they are exploiting people. Yeah. It's as simple as that. So and it, it happens in, that it happens in um, it. it's more than just India, but if we talk about just India, because obviously stone's a big one because there is a yeah. shitload of Indian stone in this country. Yeah. But with regards to tiles and tiles raw material, would that be the same? Yes, there, I think there's a certain amount. It's I don't think it's as bad because the processing of clays into ceramics is much more automated from big equipment being run and digging stuff out of the ground. Whereas with regards to the stone industry, where they haven't mechanized or they can't, or people don't want to spend the money on getting very, very expensive bits of equipment, it's much easier to use the local bonded labor yeah. to be chipping up those bits of stone into sets and producing yeah. all these uh, products that we see what kind of things that do, do, would they be doing so i mean the kids are there sometimes you, you see the f pictures of children just sitting there literally breaking down bigger pieces of stone into smaller pieces of stone what they call dressing and trying to create cubic shapes for what we call sets that will go into garden designs um yeah there's all sorts of different aspects of putting finishes on things where you're just tapping away on the surface to make it rough but yeah. my personal view is if you just ban it across the board, then you, everyone's in the same boat and then they'll have to re readjust or reset things. You know, yeah. We're go in. to Portugal and get their cheap granites there. They're a bit more expensive, but yeah. you're going to a much more trusted resource that will already be tested and you'll know what the product is. Yeah, we're, we're, we're screwed now because we're used to the prices. Yeah, so there'll, there'll always and be pressure now to keep the price the same. It, I, I will just keep saying it all the time and i've said it a few times on let's say some of the posts that i've done that stone should not be a cheap material you pay for what you get there's always a cost in the long run and the other big cost is the fact that a lot of stone will be used badly or set badly and will fail because of that and landscaping in particular is one massive industry because of all these uh, you know wishes of people with their gardens the bit they want to enjoy People um, designing and building gardens, which just are rubbish at the end of the day, as far <laughs> as I'm concerned, just are not built to any good design. They're not built to the few standards that we do have. That's first and foremost. But the standards are not a target. They're the absolute minimum. And they're not even achieving that most yeah. of the time. Well, people don't know. It's um, like it, it, they're not aware. So this is this is why I became aware of you. That's what started it. Yes. You were... Call, I was upsetting everyone. Out. Well, yes. you were giving people information, and it was upsetting some people. If you, without yeah. naming any names, I don't like naming names anyway. But if you can yeah. explain, you know the, you know what I'm referring to. The first, oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So if you tell people about that particular thing, because I think it's interesting anyway, because people listening might be very surprised to what with what you've got to say about that. Well. The most basic design that everyone promotes on TikTok with regards to landscaping and all the landscapers, it seems, who are showing off on TikTok and some big, big followings there. Um, there's one or two who are avoiding the natural stone who are doing porcelain. And I won't say anything against them. There's one or two really good guys. But when it comes to natural stone, the design, the basic design is this one that what I call the rigid on flexible. And this is the worst case scenario for engineering design it's like 
trying to bond a poppadom onto loose rice um and then thinking if you step on that it's just going to crumble it can't support anything now if you try to bond a poppadom onto another pop a stack of them then there's a bit more support there but it's still not great you might it can split up but find something solid at the end of the day if you are laying natural stone it's terrible intention it doesn't like to be bent so stone breaks easily if you bend it it's about one tenth to one twentieth the strength as it is in compression very simple basic fact about stone is great in compression you always design for it to be in compression rather than tension paving is all about tension so you're meant to ideally either lay concrete lay a mortar and lay your stone on that um reinforce it ideally as well to sort of counteract the other stresses there but all of that gets bonded together to create a big fat unit that will resist all the tensions and stuff like that um the alternative is you make your stone so thick that it doesn't bend easily in the first place and is more than strong enough the thicker you make something the more resistance it has to breaking it's very simple it's also an inverse square relationship so that means that you have something that's 10 millimeters thick you make it 20 millimeters thick it's actually four times the, the amount of load required to break it at that point by just going by doubling the thickness ideally most pavings should be if they're sedimentary rocks around about 40 to 50 mil thick to be able to resist the types of designs that these guys are doing but they're laying sometimes down to only 10 millimeter thick stone tiles onto things often it's just 20. it's just not good enough they're not strong enough on these rather weak mortar beds that they're laying and it doesn't matter whether they bond them or not and there's all these arguments in the trade about we need to bond it we need to do this and my view is yeah you do need to bond it but bond it to something that's solid not a rubbish what we call this type 1 mot layer that everyone puts down um you can compact it all you like but it's still loose material at the end of the day you try and stick anything to that layer it will come away but they still think that the amount of mortar that they lay plus the stone is rigid and sufficient enough because oh yeah they can walk on it yes you can walk on it but give it a, a year or two with heating and cooling on a really hot day it will crack it will expand it will do things they don't do other little things in their design such as separating the paving from the surrounding landscaping so water can come in from the beds adjacent will come into the mortar beds will saturate them and you'll get frost expansion and heaving and all manner of things occur the reason why many people think there aren't as many failures is that people don't recognize failure at all or they pull up with it the fact is it's outside their patios cracked oh my patios cracked or the, oh yeah well it's it's the sort of thing almost accepted as happening without realizing you can design a paving that will last you 50 years and never crack with a good quality material and that's what can be done with not much more expense as long as you think about it carefully beforehand and design it properly in the first place yeah and have good quality materials in the right way there's lots of different design i could go on for hours about different types of design in different situations but it's getting over this you either build everything rigid all stuck together you either build it flexible which is everything not stuck together but massive enough that it doesn't matter or you don't do this crazy little rigid thin thing on top of a flexible base which just is what everyone does yeah. because it's easy quick um it's getting rid of rubbish materials i mean type 1 mot has all sorts of plastic and other horrible bits in it and it's it's a way of getting waste product into somewhere where it's all hidden away yeah but would, would that be in with yeah. would that be within the standards and you're just disagreeing with the standards at the moment or is there it... are standards out there and if you stretch the standards it's just about allowable with natural stone but you've got to have certain types of aggregates certain gradings to certain things which are not complied with very very rarely are they complied with unless you spend the money on the what we call the pr proprietary products there's two or three manufacturers of really good bedding mortar systems out there and they recommend the whole way of using their products the right way but you end up spending twice as much it's as simple as that as i say you always end up spending the money if you're going to do it right yeah um even some of those products that are on the market they are 
I would say cheating with the designs that they are coming up with. They are using lots of additives in the mixes to make them have the properties they require rather than making the materials do the hard work. They're just going, well, we haven't got the materials that we need, so well, let's throw something that will make it a bit more sticky or this that will make it more flowable in this way. And those things will bite you kind of a few years later because there's, they're usually organic based and they will break down and they'll cause future problems. Yeah. But they'll get you a few years of use without a problem. Yeah. To me, they're still cheating. They're not relying on a good solid design. Yeah, it should last forever. And you, you do see, even indoors, mm. I see indoor stuff, lots of like subtle, yeah. subtle type failures that people are just like, don't notice or just if, if anyone spent a day with me they'd be thinking everything around them was failed <laughs> because of the way i pick up detail i've just <clears throat> i'll be pointing out cracks on things and people are going where where and my <laughs> eyesight's not that good but it's just i zero in on all of the features and how things are working yeah. and cracks why i like the abseiling is is that you're moving around you can look this way and you won't see a crack. Then you'll move to there, you'll see it. And then you'll move to here and you can't see it again. <laughs> Just different different ways of looking at buildings. Yeah. You have to be always aware, which is, this is why everyone says, oh, drone surveys, why are you doing this? Get a drone. Well, a drone just looks forward mostly and photographs like this. And it actually misses so much fine detail. And yeah. you can't push and pull things as well. Drone what, surveys are a complete waste of what time. What kind of safety? Do, do you have to do like an annual working at heights thing or like be an expert um, climber or something because you know <clears throat> serious heights <laughs> so if you are doing rope access in the uk there are certain trade organizations and the main ones known as irata which is the industrial rope access trade association now it is a trade association but the british standard is based upon the guidance that they created and um, controversially i don't like it because I believe it's a bit of a closed shop at the top and they are making stuff up that maybe helps them, possibly. I don't think it's professional enough. Um, I shall just leave it at that. Um, I don't agree with what's going on there. Um, things have sort of, I hope, have been changing over the few years, but a few years back, I didn't feel that it was a, a professional enough organisation. But because it's there, everyone says, oh, you've got to have errata training. So I've had the errata training over many times. I've kind of dropped out from doing it, but I should keep redoing it just to say to people, yeah, I've done my every three years, I've got my certification. But it is one of those things, it's like riding a bike. You don't forget it because it's so dangerous. And I'm working with people <clears throat> regularly who are checking everything I do because you've always got to have a certain level of person working with you. And I've been doing it for... 28 years now the rope access and the other day you know a guy i was hoping to do a survey for insisted i have the errata and i said i'm not errata i said, I don't believe in it i'm insured i've got all the insurance for doing this work so errata is irrelevant but they said no we're not having it i said well good luck with finding someone else then it's simple <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to go out and get myself errata certified just because one or two clients are sucked into they've got to have you know that box ticking exercise yeah um and i i really do hate box ticking exercises if something has to have meaning for me now <clears throat> sorry i just got <clears throat> clear my throat a bit yeah i'll just give you one quick extra example was the other day i gave a talk to the essex rock and mineral society and i gave them a talk three years ago where part of the talk was i put up one of my um method statements and risk assessments, which we call RAMs, which are, you know, the standard thing in all construction you to show what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, da -de -da, all for the health and safety. For the last 10 years, because I was always suspicious, I put in a little gift there of a dinosaur running down the street, growling, so that when I sent people my RAMs, it had this active little dinosaur in the RAMs. And... Seven, you know, three years ago when I gave the talk and told people about what I'd done, I said that at this state, right then, after seven years, no one had ever commented on the dinosaur. If you saw a dinosaur, you'd think, what the hell's a dinosaur running down the street doing in the rams? So I knew no one was reading these things. I was preparing <laughs> all, you know, multiple pages of stuff. Everyone said, like, we need your rams, we need your rams. But no one ever read them. 
Yeah. And when I gave the talk the other day, I was able to announce that after 10 years, finally someone said, what's the dinosaur? <laughs> it took 10 years of however many hundreds of presentations of these yeah. bloody documents yeah. that everyone insists on for the, yeah. I believe, the first person who's ever actually read them. Yeah. Well, you, you, goes, you, you know, box ticking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say that. You, you hit the nail on the head. It's box ticking and like, why do we have... So I always used to get in trouble for things like that. With It was usually with health and safety, usually. Mm. Because I was like, I'm not arguing with you for the sake of it, but why have we got to do that? Like, why? Yeah. They didn't All really know. Yeah, they didn't really know. So yeah, so so all of this um, experience that you've got, yeah. you can obviously like people hire you for your knowledge, and you can go climb up a building, tell them about whatever fucking roofs falling off, whatever. <laughs> you you told me that you you went you did end up going to university for geology and astronomy. Yes. After that, what? Because obviously, I doubt you could do what you do right now straight out of university. What was your professional? No. Path like. I was lucky enough, my first job was for a civil engineering consultancy. And my whole job hunting experience in my life was I wrote one letter to that company on the recommendation of a friend of my mother's. And they've called me in for an interview and I got the job. And they had this little geology department that was running there and they were looking at aggregates for concrete and a whole range of other sort of engineering issues involving stone. But they're also doing concretes and cements. So I got into looking at what concretes were and cements were and their use. If you think about every product we use in building near enough is made from geological materials because we're digging up clays, we're digging up the rocks, we're processing them. The cement itself is manufactured from chalk, clay materials, uh, been you know heated up, bound together. But there's always a geological part to it. And then those materials put, are put into the environment all artificial materials are going through what we call the engineering weathering, which is the weather around us. But there's usually much more focus of that weathering on built structures. Um, that's what we were trying to work out is how does this all work? Um, so it was a fascinating first job, which I stuck at for six years, became a, the senior geologist there. And then their, sort of one of their rivals then poached me because they offered me a lot more money. I actually did the time-honored thing of lying about how much I was being paid when they asked. Of course. Bumped it up, <laughs> bumped it up by a considerable amount, yeah. and uh, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And uh, so then went to work for this sort of rival company for eight years, doing very much the similar thing, but they were less advanced. So I was basically there to set up a department as a young consultant doing consultancy work, but setting up a testing um, arm as well to test natural stone materials and concrete and uh, when I left there it was actually pretty successful but I'd had enough um, I'm the worst person on the planet to work for because again of the way that I am I expect too much of people I was like just go away and sort it out because I that's how I've always been is go and work it out or <laughs> get the books or whatever it is, is yeah, yeah. People, okay I hear yeah. what you're saying but sort it out yeah yeah <laughs> That's fine, though. People usually do know the answer, if they, but they, they'll take the easy route first, which is yeah. ask you. So that was my, I say, my work, ex, work um, searching was one letter. That was my whole life, being poached. And then I went alone. And that I've never had to ever worry about work, really. I think I was in an interesting industry. I looked at all of my strengths and my passions, and that's what I made into my job. Love obviously the geology i love the surveying side of things the history the archaeology side of things but just buildings in general the the yeah. way architecture is i've learned so much along the way i mean I'm, I'm nowhere near as good as an architect but I, at least i can hold my own in knowing what you know a volute is on a <laughs> on a column capital and all the little bits and pieces that go together and why they are there and the, yeah. all the different styles and things it, it's fascinating yeah. once you get into I, it i would suggest that I don't know what those things are that you've just said, but I would suggest to anybody listening to go to your TikTok because you explain a lot of that type of stuff. It's really good. Oh, yeah. It's really interesting. Well, so it's the unseen stuff to a lot of people. They see it in the distance up on buildings, and it looks nice, but you, know, you go up close. I'm showing people, well, this is what a volute is. This is what the coli coli are growing out of this bit. They're just names, but actually being able to point it out 
go they're all there for a reason all yeah. these little bits and that's what yeah. i enjoy yeah so your career a lot so i've we've talked i've talked about um uh, qualifications and education and then training mm. and then career with with most yeah. every guest virtually and i'm always i've always been of the opinion because i did a survey when i was at university i, I did like a job what the, the surveys very few people use the university degree for the future career they yeah. might they might need it to apply for a job but it's got fuck all to do with what they end up doing <laughs> but from what you've just said to me where you kind of got your first job from uni because of university and that kind of set you up for life university yeah. for, for what you do is crucial <laughs> it, absolutely yeah. and one of the key aspects of sheffield so sheffield had a fantastic geology department which was formed on the back of a man called Henry Clifton Sorby, if I get his name right now, but Sorby, I always think of him as Sorby. There was a Sorby Hall at Sheffield. I don't know if it's still there, actually. Hope it is. Um, but Sorby was the guy who came up with the method for making what we call thin sections. And this is a geological process where you make a very, very thin sliver of the rock, so thin you can sort of see through it. Um, and that allows you to put various microscopic techniques of shining light through the sample and polarizing and doubly polarizing the light and other things that you can do, which help tell you what crystals are there. And then you can see the fabrics and textures or structures that are there as well. And that tells you so much information about a rock, but then all the extra stuff, I've, as I explained earlier, you know, that you can start inferring from the grain size, the presence of fossils, for example, um, bedding, laminations, veining. There's so many structures that could be there, which you see in an instant with the thin section technique. So Sheffield was such a great uh, basis for learning that trade. And that's been used for looking at so many materials, not just rocks, but with concrete, cement, plasters, renders, screeds, you name it. I look at everything down the microscope in addition to going out, doing the survey, digging bits of it out, taking samples, and then looking at it. There's other analysis you can do, but what we call the petrographic examination, this looking down the microscope at these thin slides, is such a powerful technique, which very few people really know how to do properly. Um, and there's a geological company, I've just been asked to train their staff up in uh, how to do thin section work because they're forever getting asked all of these questions, but it is such an art. And even the geologists they have, many geologists don't get trained enough. So you would use that technique. So if you if you were called out to a 500 year old building, and yeah, would you need to use that technique at, at some point, maybe on a building? How do you get the sample? Well, it might be with, say, an old building. So someone's got an old building and they go, well, we've got no idea what the stone is. So you rock up and you go, well, where is it, the building, in relation to the local area? Because stone is such a massive material. And in older days, they would never move it too far from where that location is. It's very rare to get stone from much further afield. This is why Stonehenge, you know, more recently has been found that the main quarry for a lot of the material was only a few kilometres up the road. Uh, not, you know, all these things far afield. People didn't move stuff in the romantic way that uh, <laughs> some archaeologists will have you believe. You know? But anyway, let's go off topic there. Most stuff is built very close to the resources. So you look at what the local rocks are, see if you can identify what those rocks are and see if they match. That's quite simple to do. Because often there's old quarries or there's still a quarry there and you can go and check the material. When you get to 1600 to 1700, that's when materials started to be shipped a little bit further as tracks and things became more developed and the canals came in as well for bigger materials. Then, of course, the trains came in. So this is why places like all the, the stations in and around London, the big stations were built by all the big landowners and builders who had their quarries up north and were bringing them down the railways or from the west, bringing them in on the well. Suddenly we had materials coming from Portland down in... Dorset coming into London um, and that's become the material of choice throughout the city of London that cream colored slightly sort of grayish looking light colored stone you see everywhere St Paul's Cathedral is Portland stone and it is a beautiful material it works really well in the London environment 
Um, but that's been shipped really only since, I think it was Ban Banqueting House in 1610 was the first uh, structure in London built with Porton Stone. They built one floor with it. But it was Wren's use with St. Paul. So that was started building in uh, 1666, 67, I think, when they fi finally started. Then that went all the way through to 1710. And when they you know, unveiled the finished St. Paul's in all this wonderful Portland stone, people threw rocks at it because it was kind of, they almost couldn't comprehend the scale of it and the, the style of it as well was so different to the kind of gothic -y styles that we had prior to that. And it's funny to think that people hated it at that time, yeah. uh, where they were throwing rocks at the cathedral. <laughs> it, this beautiful Portland stone, it stood the test of time, and it is a most marvellous building. Yeah, because it's, um, it's different. Uh, this is different. Yeah, uh, that happens so, now. And this is the thing. So most stuff you can pretty quickly tell, but it's only with more modern construction in sort of more recent times where things, if they've been moved around, you can look at them and go, well, I think it's from such and such. But... That's when we'll think about taking a sample. And some people say, well, you can't take it from the outside, but maybe you can find a location that's hidden or from an inside point of view where no one's going to see the damage. And you can take, always take materials. More recently, we've got things like X-ray fluorescence. Now I have a handheld X-ray fluorescence, which is a looks like a giant phaser gun, which you can actually press against the piece of stone, pull the trigger, and it gives you an elemental analysis of uh -huh. the material you're looking at. And if you do, um, you can do reference stones and compare and contrast the results. And uh, that can be amazingly accurate, in fact. Wow. So you don't have to take samples now. Amazing. Uh, are, there any, are there any buildings around now that, that would be considered modern, like within the last 50 years or so, that maybe in 500 years, someone like you would say, oh, this is an amazing building and this was built 500 years ago and... <laughs> Is there anything? The, I mean, it's a shame that things like Battersea Power Station have already been decimated once because they didn't realise, even though they built those with such a massive amount of bricks, the bricks and the coal burning or, or burning, whichever burning they were doing was having a reaction with the bricks and destroyed so much of the brick masonry there. So that's all been redone, rebuilt. But if it's looked after, that will be there in 500,000 years, for sure. So, And there's plenty of other buildings which were built solidly enough in the last 100 years that will be around if we just simply maintain them. Um, yeah. Just, just, just I think change I'm the subject. Have you seen um, Children of Men? Do you know that movie? Yes. I actually watched that again the other day for some reason. So, yes. it, it may, so that's the future. I love stuff like that. That's one of my favourite films, actually. So That's like future dystopia. Everything's gone to shit. Yeah. But... The headquarters of the main uh, main bad guy, maybe, is Battersea Power Station. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Uh, um, so they knew. Did you know? I mean, I, I'm still wondering whether it's a rumour or one of those things put out to get a bit more popularity, but there's um, university, the College of you know, University of London. Um, their main building in Mallet Street, which is the big, there's a big tower building there. That's been used in some of the Batman films. And supposedly that tower... Adolf Hitler liked it so much that was going to be his uh, UK <laughs> base when he invaded and took over. That he wanted that as his uh, base. Well, it must be good if Hitler wanted There's it. Some all sorts of crazy stories. I thought stories Batman like was all that. Edinburgh. What do you think of Edinburgh? Because that's Gotham, isn't it? Um, Is that, Edinburgh right? Right? had an interesting history with Edinburgh because back in 1996, I think, or seven. Um, a massive piece of masonry fell down from a place called Ryan's Bar, smashed through the roof or sort of ceiling of a, an outside area and killed this lady. Um, and I ended up doing loads of surveys in Edinburgh and Glasgow of a lot of buildings post that because of the safety concerns over the older buildings. So I've scaled a lot of buildings in both Edinburgh and Glasgow and i absolutely loved my time up there with the especially the georgian architecture but i was abseiling a building on princess street literally in christmas week and i even though we had solid barriers out away from the pavement i called the survey off the one and only time i've ever done it because the masonry was so loose in some places on that building we were on uh, we would potentially kill someone if we dislodged anything so i had to say this is too dangerous. We're not surveying with all these people around. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, uh, that that sticks in the mind that particular survey. I have to say. Yeah. So do you mind if we go back to? So I started asking you about um, patios because that's kind mm. of my world. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in Edinburgh and trying to trying. To, it's really interesting to watch you talk about it, but I'm on a patio level. <laughs> <laughs> That's my knowledge, but if you don't mind, um, I'm going to ask you two different ways of doing it. So a porcelain patio and a stone yeah. and a stone patio. What would be the absolute perfect conditions and the perfect system, all the correct materials to use, and the correct way of doing it? One for a porcelain patio, and then one for a stone patio and it'd be interesting for people to hear because i think they might disagree with you oh yeah everyone will disagree because i will choose the most expensive way of doing it yeah. as simple as that the, the belt and braces way because we build a floor inside so you want to do a tiled floor inside and what will happen is you've got underfloor heating there maybe so you'll have usually a concrete base You'll then have maybe a layer of screed on top of that, which your underfloor heating is hidden in. You'll be thinking, right, all that heating that's going on there, potentially, then I'll have an uncoupling membrane put in place. And you're making sure you've glued that down, then you've put more adhesive on top of that. And then you'll be sticking your tiles, whether they're stone or porcelain, onto that. And internally, if you've got underfloor heating, you have to have movement joints every eight meters at the very most and the maximum base size or floor area 40 square meters which means if you have eight meters then it's got to be five meters that way it's best to think six by six really in terms of six by six but depending on the shape of your room you've got to have perimeter joints as well of course okay most underfloor heating systems when you're internally well if you had them switched off would never go below five to eight degrees maybe in the general environment and when they're working, should only be at most working temperature. And it is a European dictac of about 22 degrees. So you've got only you know, 15 degree temperature range that's actually working there at that surface. But you've got to make all of that allowance with an uncoupling membrane and with movement joints here, there and everywhere. Let's move, move everything to the external patio area, which you're tiling now. Now you can get temperatures up to 100 degrees easily at the surface of those things. You know, the whole fry an egg on a sunny day. And at wintertime, that floor will dive down, we know, temperatures to minus 10, 15. So you've got suddenly a 110, 115 degree range in temperature versus 15 degrees. And we've put uncoupling membranes in and movement joints in internally. Externally, everyone thinks that's all going to be all right. No movement joints, no membranes in there, nothing. And uh, now do you want to see the sense of how stupid all these designs are compared to what we have to do internally? No one has any thought whatsoever. Movement joints should go in generally at most every five meters externally for patios, full stop. Um, you are going to get cracking and you will always get cracking if you don't put them in or you put them in bigger than that. And I've seen that time and time again. Um, that's why the joints start to break down with most patios fairly quickly. Number one, they're using rubbish jointing materials or they're using epoxy grouts, which don't work with natural stone. Fine with porcelain, but with stone, they don't work. The epoxy does not stick to stone very well. And those joints will fail under expansion and contraction. So there are so many other things that just don't work. But people on Social media are hocking all those products left, right, and center. They've got something to sell. They'll give you a story. And I'm sorry, they're all crap. It's utter crap, garbage, what they're selling you or trying to push forward. There are people that have no clue as to how the whole thing works together in the design. Just some salesman's told them that this is a wonderful product. None of these guys have any research backup to any of these things that they're selling you other than it was used in outer Mongolia in 19-whenever. Uh, maybe who knows because we don't know they don't research these things with all the different types of stones and how they will behave there are many different types of porcelain or other clay products out there as well have they done the research with each one when you get what they call an agrimont certificate for a building product when you read the certificate carefully it's for that product with that material in that way it's very specific and that's what you'll get certification for just one 
very specific design, they'll get the certification for a product. But then you're using it in thousands of different ways with different types of products, with different thicknesses, whatever it may be. And it doesn't apply. All these guarantees never apply. Um, that's is why we get the arguments in the trade over what they think is best. Everyone's got their method they think works. But they say, oh, no, I never have a failure. I'll tell you, I challenge everyone, show me one of your structures from five years or older. Invite me down. I'll look at every single one. I'll bet you I'll find you at least 10 different types of failure working on whatever you think hasn't failed. Yeah. And I'll explain yeah. why each of these things have happened think... as well. For the so, I think some of the guys will be aware, right, that it's not the perfect way of doing it, and the price—it's the price that I'm willing to forgive a few subtle failures, such as I don't know a grout failure or a little bit of movement, yeah. something that most people won't notice, or like stain or dirt or things like that, for the price that it was done for. Because the the alternative is, like you say, two or three times more, mm. and getting someone who actually knows how to do it for two or three times yeah. more, because there probably isn't many of them as either. For so, so for a stone patio, right? Give me <laughs> if you were if you were asked to do a stone patio, cost no question. What's yeah. the ideal substrate? Ideal adhesive? Ideal stone? Grout? It, everything? It's what I did myself which is I do a concrete base. Um, then if I need, if I've done it badly, <laughs> then you'll put in, you'll bond it, a, a screed layer onto that. And then it's all about trying to, your design, whether you're going to try and manage the water on the surface, which means you can't have any cracks anywhere, basically forming. You've got to get the water that comes in from the rain or from the site, wherever, you've got to manage it so it doesn't go into the construction. And that's really difficult. But that's why you've got to make sure everything's solid bonded. Then you're bonding your stone down. And I would nearly always end up using a straightforward proprietary adhesive from one of the what I call the big guys, the real big manufacturers like Adhead or Bal or whoever is your one of choice. But there are some great guys who know their certainly their stone products. And that is as simple as that, making this one big fat, very solid unit. But then your drainage is key in making sure everything is running away, managed quickly, getting water shifted as fast as you can. It gets more difficult the more sort of rougher your stone surface is. You've got to have increasing falls, which people don't like, um, to get rid of that water in a way that won't cause problems. Now, the other part I'm going to have to add quickly as well is one thing you must never, ever, ever do externally any reason whatsoever unless you really know what you're doing is seal it i was going to ask you that you... Yeah. <laughs> that's a video sealers, that's a famous video that you've done as sealers well. are the absolute nightmare because you cannot predict what's going to happen when you apply a sealer to any material they are sold as being oh the water can get out no actually water can't get out if you see this stone surface and water gets in underneath for any reason which is usually from the sides or a failed joint and water goes down a slightly cracked failed joint and there can be hairline but once it's open water gets in there it gets sucked in by capillary action it just keeps building up and up because the sealer then stops it from coming out they say well oh yes it's vapor permeable yes that's vapor permeable if it's going in as water if it doesn't change to vapor it doesn't come out it has to turn to water vapor. Yes, maybe in the sunshine when it's all sunny, yes. But in the winter time, when the temperatures are low, or you've got other reasons that the humidity is so high that you don't get vapor forming inside that stone patio. It just collects as more and more moisture. And then when the first frost hits and you've got something that's saturated, it will then blows the surface of the stone. Um, and that I've seen time and time again. I've been showing stuff of things... Uh, in some talks recently where you know only a year later the first frost everything just pops gone because yeah. it got saturated big heavy frost comes in the, the water expands inside everything can't go anywhere and explodes the stone yeah uh, because it's going into tension it's this internal in reaction that it's having the expansion inside is a tensional reaction as i said at the start compression versus tension with stone you've got to avoid tension and 
sealers promote tensional failure. Wow. Just, uh, I, I, before watching your videos and, and what you've just said, I would have thought the opposite. So a sealer would protect it from that. And it's not. It's, no. It makes it worse. It's, or it it's causes the it. biggest gamble you will ever take with natural stone for its failure. So you would never Absolutely. recommend a sealer? If you know what you're doing. So there are some great products out there. Uh, which are great internally, where you can control things internally. And as I say, the temperature ranges and the things mean sealers are great in situations where you might drop oil for some reason in the kitchen, you know, frying. They make your life much easier with regards to maintenance. And I 100% I'm behind sealers for use internally for all manner of reasons where you can control things. But externally, you can't control. So the only times you'd use a sealer externally is with stones like granites and that, which are strong enough to resist frost. They don't have enough, you can't get enough moisture into them in the first place to expand and cause problems. So with igneous rocks in particular, sealers, you can use them maybe to enhance the color or something, but generally they're that strong and hard in the first place that you don't really need to use them anyway. Unless maybe you are, you've got a barbecuing area where you are going to spill a load of stuff if you are. Uh, yeah, one of those cooks <laughs> we call the man <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that is it but i would personally if i knew i was building a barbecue area i'd make sure i would be laying granite there and i would put a sealer down outside so i had an area i could clean more easily yeah i wouldn't put a porous sandstone or a particular limestone down there that i know is regardless of how much you i seal it and it will fall apart or i don't see it and it will have all the oil stains yeah the alternative view is, is that you allow it to stain and eventually all the stains will join up that you end up with a, a much more sort of o an overall pattern further down the line. And my kitchen floors like that, I decided I put a quartzite in. This is one from Norway, a quartzite. And the first five years were a nightmare because you could see every spot that you've dropped, every little stain there. But it's a case of just a bit of water and detergent and just clean it. 25 years later, that floor looks beautiful because all those dots did join up eventually and create a one overall appearance that is absolutely self-cleaning now almost. Yeah, that, that's you get that with a lot of natural materials. So people want yeah. want a natural look, but they don't want it to change. And I'm, you're like, it, or the they, guys, want it, they want it to be very uni uniform. And you're like, yeah. it's not, not going to be. It's, it's the salespeople are relying on this whole thing of, oh, but if you drop something or this, you know, your lovely new patio, your, you know, how wonderful it all looks. Well, yes, but stone, you've got to leave it to develop, to get what they call the noble patina. That, that's when it looks amazing, was in time, when it gets all those bits that do weather off, that, that perfectly flat surface. Yes, you're never going to keep that. You'll get scratches, but eventually everything kind of becomes a certain way. doesn't matter what you do. It will just develop into a much more gorgeous, sort of worn-in, but natural. workable. That, that's the, natural you've brought effect. a natural material, but you don't want it to look natural. So yeah, it, I've always found that odd because we used to sell tiles for... It's like concrete. Inside. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, but it's a natural tile. And you hmm. want to, and some people so, would say, so there's a box of tiles here, natural stone. There's like eight different colors in the, in the box because it's natural. They would try and get yeah. all the same color. <laughs> from, <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen. You, and they'll try and then put one color here, one color there. It would never work. Yeah, it never works. Yeah. You just have to put all the materials out and absolutely just pick randomly if you yeah, can. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. the only way it ever works. Yeah. Um, the other thing, of course, about stone is it, the depth of color, the textures that you have with it. And that's why I love stone, whereas porcelain is, to me, is dead. It's a, it's a dead material. It has only reflection of a, a printed surface that has no depth. There's no crystallinity to porcelain. Those materials are glassy, sort of vitreous materials without any um, crystallinity to them whatsoever. So there's no internal reflections, no dancing of light within them at different angles. It's just a flat, to me, boring material. Well, it, it, <laughs> I don't know what they do just described it. what it is. It's printed. I do, do, I, I, like, yeah. I, I do like some porcelains. You get some nice ones. But I know what you're saying. They, I would definitely prefer a natural stone myself. They've got amazingly good over the last few years with their... I mean, there's some I've walked up to and thought, is that a stone? You know? Yeah, yeah. Doesn't matter how good I am, I'll still go. Oh, 
but then you get close and you go, yeah, okay, I can see now it is. And so the overall effect is actually really good. But when it still comes to that small amount, when you are in a big office space, it doesn't matter too much because no one's looking at the finer detail. But you have a lady who's got a worktop installed. She'll know every tiny nick in that worktop. The fact that if she runs her fingers across, along an edge or brushes past it, it's just one of those things that subconsciously you learn every little detail about the materials around you and they become annoying. You know, that little nick that's happened. And it's the same that people who've had stone versus other types of products are always disappointed with those other products in the end. They just don't have the same performance. I like anything in... natural, so uh, wood, yeah, solid oak, things like that. Anything that I prefer it so in the moment yeah. in, in the back garden. Well, our, our back garden. They're, they're so in your face and so personal to people. Yeah, yeah. That's why, to me, it's always worth spending that little bit more getting something yeah. that you are actually going yeah. to enjoy a lot yeah, better yeah. than yeah, so... be d just sort of always on the side of disappointment. Yeah. And that's right. what I see with ceramic tiles, that people who have ceramic tiles ultimately look at them compared to stone. They've always got that level of background disappointment there. It's, it depends, <laughs> doesn't it? It's always what are your expectations. If you knew yeah. it was, if you knew it was going to cost, if you, you trade in cost for mm. the last a, a long time and it looks nice enough and it didn't cost as much, so happy yeah. days. Whereas, I mean, the floor, that I, I put the floor in, in my office and I just asked the suppliers to give me random lengths so one thick sorry one width and all the tiles came in the random lengths from about 60 mil up to about a meter and a half in length and you start laying a line you can lay a whole line you get to wall you pick one of the stones you've got that either fits there or you only have to cut the tiniest bit off or if you haven't got anything you just cut it then you use the next bit at the start of the next row and random lengths is the best way to use natural stone because you have no waste near enough. Because you don't want joints to line, but you pick a random length that roughly ends in the middle of the stone that's there. And you end up with a beautiful random joint pattern that works. Yeah. Random lengths to me is if you're ever buying stone, just always go for random lengths. And it, you don't have to buy so much because you don't have to cut all the edge tiles and just trying to get things into a, a, a joint pattern at all. Yeah. You just keep going. So that's one sort of simple tip about use of stone is if you're buying it and you want a little bit more expensive, the way to save money is just do a random length design. Yeah, but th that, you'll get that again. So people will want the, the natural stone. They'll want to spend the money. But mm. then I've I found this with a lot of customers in my old job. They don't want it to look, as you just explained, which I prefer. I, yeah. That's why I love old cathedrals and stuff because they tended to do that. But people in, yes. in the house would... They'll, put, they'll spend the money on the stone, but then want it to look like porcelain. And you're like, why didn't you just buy porcelain <laughs> in the first place? Yeah, just buy the porcelain. If that's yeah. the way, I mean, again, or concrete tiles. Some concrete tiles you could end up with uh, some quite nice looks, but. Yeah. Right. Uh, so just, they, they, a stone patio, not very... concrete base, yes. concrete. Um, Basically. Con yeah. A good. Concrete base. A good adhesive from a good manufacturer. Yeah. Don't seal it. And don't seal it um if you have to put a, any sort of screed layer in if it's any thickness i'd reinforce that i'd always reinforce the concrete as well yeah without shadow of a doubt and grout um, grout i love uh there again all the good manufacturers have some great grouting systems um and externally there's some great flood grout i'm i'm really lazy when it comes to grout. i hate grouting so flood grouting is uh always the way to go just get it all around um with some stones it works not so well um the, especially the more porous the stone is the more the grout can go into but at the same time if you try just grouting along a joint which is hello <laughs> what was it Yoshi? that was his son <laughs> you all right come here have a nice day yeah good are you gonna be quiet just for while oh, yeah. finish speaking to barry his yeah. name barry same as your granddad <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> probably as old as him as well <laughs> no no are you going to be quiet for me and play on your computer yeah okay see you in a bit yeah. right sorry yeah I'll edit it so, I'll edit all these bits out you know one of the big problems with um, grouting 
especially if you're just doing the joints, especially with porous stones, you end up with grout going into the joints around that point and you end up picture framing effects. So that's why flood grouting often uh, the more porous materials works quite well because you just everything gets the same level of amount of grout going into the surface. You clean everything off. It sort of, I won't say seals the surface, but it makes it a little bit more resistant to dirt and other things getting into that top surface while still allowing it to breathe. Grouts themselves are breathable materials. They're not sealing it up, but they are reducing the amount of dirt and other things that can get into the surface. What if you use so, a grout that isn't breathable? Uh, there is, I mean, cements themselves, um, well, it is, is that Portland cement was designed to work underwater. That's why we call it a hydraulic cement, because it would still set even in water. And cement itself on its own is problematic from the point of view it can be very water resisting. But you put water into it and the flood grout has a lot of water inside it. It has a lot of additives as well. When you install it, as it dries, the water has to find its way out. The water's part of the medium of getting it there, but it doesn't want to hang around there. Otherwise, it leaves a very weak, you know, understrength material. The water has to come out. And it does that, it bleeds out, and it creates a pore system. So most cement products always have this micropore structure to them. All concrete has a micropore structure to it. That's why it can soak up oil and all sorts of other media. If you look at any concrete, no matter how well made it is, it's still microporous. There's all this extra moisture that has to come out of the mix. Um, so it, you don't get any grouts that are effectively non-porous other than your epoxy ones and that's why epoxy doesn't work with natural stone yeah so you wouldn't recommend epoxy, any kind of epoxy any kind of resin with a natural stone resins are, are just they create more problems than they're worth there are good, some good systems out there by one or two people but again i'm not going to start naming names on certain things i think um they just are much more difficult to use and especially externally just don't work so well internally there are situations where epoxy grouts can be made to use and on the continent they do use them a lot more as well but the uk environment here it's just a nightmare of heating cooling wetting drying freezing thawing cycles our maritime climate that we have is just uh one of the worst on the planet really with mm -hmm. the way that things are we just have to accept that we struggle with materials here. So you'd recommend a porous grout on a patio? Basically, any standard cement grout will do the job. Yes, absolutely. To me, it's always the preferred way. Yeah. So so that was a stone patio. Mm. A lot of pat a lot of the, the, the people that I deal with and, and the, the TikTok people will be doing porcelain patios. Yeah. If I know you would don't like them, but if you had to... If you had to, what's the ideal way of doing a porcelain patio? In the end, um, I would still say exactly the same way because that's the belt and braces way. But however, to me, porcelain is not as valuable a material. At the end of the day, it's a much cheaper material. It's the sort of thing that you don't expect it to last so long, although you should, ultimately. If you want it to last a long time, then do it the way I've just said with the natural stone. I, I want to look at it as more of you use porcelain in a more temporary way for a particular look, for a particular design, and that might want to be changed. I think that's also very wasteful. I still would prefer to pr promote longevity. Do something once, do it properly. So if we're moving away from that and just saying, okay, let's say for 10 years, then the standard design, really, we can't go flexible with porcelain because... We don't have the thickness, these giantly thick porcelain tiles. So we're not going to lay them on a, a flexible bed at all. It just won't be great unless we make them more blocky. Um, so you're either going the full, the full Monty with being rigid, but this whole, what I call the cowboy design of the MOT and a thick mortar bed, um, I would suggest that to minimise the issues with it, I was talking to a landscaper the other day on the little uh, podcast that he was doing, and something like a lean mix. You want a, a sort of a 
the finish concrete base, if you want to get away with the absolute minimum, that at least drains, that doesn't hold moisture. And then you're just sticking your stuff down onto that. Um, moisture is the key. 99% of the problems that you'll have with most built construction are retained moisture, how it ends up hanging around. And that's the key. So you want to make sure no water can get in, but if it does, it's got somewhere to go, that you've got your hidden drainage or things aren't going to get waterlocked, basically. So, so that's your best yeah. construction. If someone, so let's say, again, concrete base, proper adhesive from a good manufacturer, porcelain tile. If someone did use an epoxy grout or a resin, not necessarily epoxy, yeah. d does that whole scenario create a problem for an impervious grout because the water's got nowhere to go up or down, has it? Well, what you're doing is that, so you're using that grout. If any water gets in, it can drain away. So you make sure that happens. But ultimately, you are still, you want to get rid of that moisture from your surface into a drain somewhere and get it out and away. And mm -hmm. that's it. It's all you have to do. So there's some of the standards recommend um, falls of one to 60 in some circumstances, which is crazy. That's really for heavily ribbon stones, I would say. Uh, you can get away with one to 150 with porcelain tiles because of their flatness. And the draining capabilities still will be that nothing should hang around if you make that surface nice and flat. Um, you don't need too much of a fall. It can be far more subtle. And yeah, just get rid of your surface water as fast as you can. So as long as you've but, got some kind of a fall, you should be okay with most Yeah. Materials. The moment you have a client saying, I want everything level, you've already started off on the very slippery slope. For a reason, it becomes very slippery. That <laughs> no fall means that water will always sit, sit somewhere and that, you know, times of the year, that will become thin films of ice that will be absolutely lethal to people. Yeah. And that does happen. And I come from the point of view of, investigating when people have slipped over i used to do a lot of slip testing uh back in the day it's some some in cases where people have broken their necks from slipping up on things so wow. this it, to me it is a very serious subject area and therefore yeah get rid of the moisture there's no excuse for not putting falls in and having water managed correctly yeah but everyone it's easy to put in something level you know? <laughs> Um, yeah. Especially the cowboys haven't got a clue, and so they'll put something. Oh, put the laser on it, get it in level. <laughs> so, what what do you think of when um, landscapers, if you could call them landscapers, but when they just do um, sand like a sand bed? What do you call those? Um, so, if you've got like block pavers and things like that, yeah, yeah. Um, or anything. So, as long as the material on top can withstand the loading of being near enough unsupported so again if you think about it of a bowl of rice where you put something rigid thin and rigid on it you poke it that will break yeah so the thicker and thicker you make it the less likely it will be to break it can sit there so yeah. when you do a flexible system where you're using sand this is why block pavers all those brick yeah. pavers yeah. or other types of sets and things work because they're thick yeah but they're also small so they the longer something is the easier it is to bend in the middle yeah we all know that something short and stubby like this, you try and sit and stand on that, it will take a good hell. You make that a few meters long and go in the middle of that, you'll break it probably with just with minimal uh, force because of the way that uh, you know leverage works. Yeah. In the realistic terms. So that's why block pavers work. You're locking all these things together. They can't really move. If the bedding support collapses, then you can just take some of the pavers up, refill, recompact, and put them back again. And to me, that's the beauty of a flexible design. Uh, if you do have a problem, then you can reuse near enough everything, adjust it, and go back to where you were near enough. So yeah. the where they make the mistake with flexible designs is they use the wrong sands. Right. Um, what you should be doing is using single-sized granitic material. So you're getting very angular particles of, a, say, three mil, four mil size, which are all locked together, but leave a lot of space so they can drain more freely. If you have a graded sand, which has lots of different sizes, all the smaller sizes go in between the bigger ones and then the really small stuff. So when you compact it, it creates a much more solid um, bed that can hold moisture more easily as well. Yeah. 
but it also the finer stuff also starts washing away, finding its way out, and that's when the whole thing collapses. And there are other reasons why it collapses. What would that sand be called? And the um... so it's just single size uh, crushed igneous rock of some, something like a granite, but it's the single size part which is the critical thing. When they make railways and put the sleepers down on bed, look at all the angular rocks that they use. You think this was all like crumble away? No, they lock together with the pressure and they take the pounding of the railways, uh, you know, the, the trains running over those. You think of the amount of pounding they take and they drain easily because those particles are got lots of space between them, but they have amazing elasticity and strength even though all the points are sort of there. And that's how they lock. It's on the micro scale with block paving. If you use a crushed granite aggregate of a single size, you'll get much better performance. It won't compact so much. It will drain much better. But of course, it costs a little bit more. Yeah. So, and with the jointing sands that go in, they often put what they call, you know, fine silver sand, or there's different terms that you use just to get them down the joints because they are so, so thin. Yeah, yeah. That's tough will wash away down through and into the materials below eventually. And it's just a question of, well, just keep, you just need to explain to people to top it up every now and then, just to keep everything tight together. If you don't, then it washes out, things start to rock around. The more things rock, the more they pound the material below. Yeah. So if you've got a vehicle being parked regularly on the same spot, all that material gets almost shaken slowly down uh, into all of the... Uh, materials below and disappears so yeah maintenance is also key with those things but they're easily re kind of adjusted you can you know, rejuvenate them yeah so you're not a fan of mot which get used to, it does get used a lot um, you prefer it to see, be a concrete MOT's fine underneath the concrete not as the base to the mortar it's yeah. just i don't care all this oh i can i've, I've compacted this didn't that, did that no you can't, you think that's still a loose surface material and you can't stick anything to it. I'll show you what happens even with material. So here's a bit of stone, nice bit of dark limestone there. And on the back of this, we see shiny mats there. That's been stuck on with epoxy. Right. If you ever receive a stone tile with this on it, get rid of it because that epoxy does not stick to cement products very easily because when you press it into a mortar bed, um, water squeezes out. You know this the test you do with screeds? When yeah. you get a mortar, you squeeze it, and the water comes out to the surface. That's what happens when you press a, a stone tile onto a mortar bed. Water squeezes out to this surface. It can't get sucked into the back of this because this is a resin. It's, so you end up sealed. with a watery, yeah. watery film here, which just causes it to delaminate. So why is that there? They put it here to now to fill in the... the painting resins all over the stones these days to fill in gaps and holes and things but there are so many weaker products that they put this there for reinforcement of the stone but secondly when they pack the stones together you've got resin to stone faces meeting each other right. and it protects the face of the stone from being scratched okay. as well so there's a few benefits to having it but these things don't last yeah, yeah, now, yeah. that one's already peeling here's one i prepared earlier with <laughs> resin base and that just came away like that the whole thing leaving still resin on the back here but that's a resinous wafer that's now come away and that's what happens that's what happens with resins they don't stick to stone very easily it's that like it's was... been primed with resin at the factory yeah so how's that going to stay stuck if that's what's going to happen with that resin so that's i've never nice seen that yeah i've never seen that before demonstration. that's why all of the good guys in the stone industry who know natural stone, you ask any of them, they say, oh, you've got to re remove the resin from the back of the, the tiles. But in the domestic market, no one knows that at all, it seems. Wow. It's very simple. And that's why these, you know, there are many other things like that which cause things to fail. Have you, have you um, done much with the pedestal systems? I was... Uh, on the sort of periphery of a few of them where there were quite a few failures in the early days of putting especially stone onto them. Um, and I actually recommended the pedestal system for an area where there was a big house for someone who was very rich, or I can't name them, but they had a problem. And we, we suggested the pedestal system was the only way to get around the problem of the drainage issues they had. And there we ended up with a, a 40 millimeter thick 
granite slabs that they used on the pedestals to make sure that when they were driving certain equipment over the pedestaled areas, they didn't break the tiles. And that's the, the big issue with pedestal systems is you've got a big gap to um, get across that with stone, as I say, poor intention. So you've got to make your stone thick enough to resist Loads. And there are calculations that I do regularly for pavings and uh, for these sorts of scenarios to make sure that the stone is strong enough for given loading situations. Yeah. And you know, I have to do calculations for when you know multiple buses and all sorts of things go over stone um, developments. And it's still shockingly bad, the knowledge. I, I saw within the last week another two stone schemes in you know in road schemes which are failing and uh it, it's just it's it's heartbreaking that people are spending the money on nice materials and then just not knowing how to use them yeah and end up digging them up turning them into blacktop again you know it's always costing it it's always like right we've got yes. this we've got this stone but we can't pay more than the x amount 20 pound a square yeah. meter to fit it so yeah. it's like well that's not that's nobody's fault. And you can't blame the trees. Unfortunately, we're driven by in the public realm. I'd say we're driven by an awful lot of engineers who don't know enough about stone as an engineering material. And it's if I told you that often the best stone or the strongest stone is often not the right stone for all sorts of situations. Yeah. There are times when you get a strong limestone from a quarry, whereas the weathered one you get from the quarry is actually better for a particular use because it's been weathered and it's got no nasty materials that can weather out of it whereas the solid unweathered material has the potential to weather and the minerals come out and cause staining and uh, cause internal destruction basically that does happen with natural products so you can get all the test results you like, but if you don't understand the geology and the, the, the real reasoning behind those results and where the whole product lies in the sequence of things with regards to weathering processes, then you won't have a clue as to how best to use it. And I'd say there's probably less than 10 people in the UK who really do know how to do that type of thing. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, like the skills needed. I presume, it's, it's I presume the dying or dead. <laughs> Well, it's a nightmare with so many products on the market. And to me, it's just a good geological brain, a good observation, good experience in the engineering sphere, and bringing that all together as being able to predict what the hell is actually happening with a lot of these products. So failures after failures after failures do occur. And the stone gets to blame. And I would say the stone didn't ask to be quarried. The stone didn't ask to be put into that design. The stone didn't ask to be abused by the people using it or not maintaining it. The stone is inanimate, so the stone can never be blamed. If there's a crack in your floor, that's a crack in your floor. It's not a crack in the stone. It's not a crack in what you see, the, the final result, because the stone is just the finish at the end of the day. The first thing that you see, when you know there's a problem, because stone is the finish, you'll see it because it affects the finish. But that crack or that stain has not been caused by the stone. It's been caused by man's mismanagement of the whole thing. Yeah. It's never the stone's fault. And I, I, I come at my investigation. Yeah. But I come at my investigations from the point of view of the stone because it comes without bias, I would say. Because I'm the inanimate thing. I just go, right, what's happened to me? I'm a stone sitting here. I've cracked. <laughs> what's underneath me? What, who put me here? How did they put me here? How was I quarried? All those questions. You should do a TikTok um, post as the stone. <laughs> well, that's That'd why I be hilarious. It stone. It is the, the reason I said stone. It's all about stone, but I am stone. I think of myself as stone <laughs> to solve the problems of why have I ended up here. Yeah. <laughs> I think you've given me way more than I've asked for. Um <laughs> I've covered more or less everything that I wanted to cover. I wanted to ask you about social media. You kind of covered it by saying you're, yeah. you're looking for 10,000 followers so you can start making a library out of your TikTok. And I think TikTok, TikTok yes. is the right place to do it. I don't think... I think it's by far... the. It's not perfect, but it's by far the, the no. best uh, social media platform, especially for what you want to do. Yeah, and I think the, the editing suite with it and the way I now can present and edit things... Um, suits me as well and the, the type of things that I'm doing with it. I think I've got pretty good at some of the editing now with uh, the effects yeah. and things. But yeah. 
just to make them look more professional and yeah. watchable. Yeah. And so are you, you don't really... You post things on the others just to... Are you on any of the others? Or it, the... It's literally... I just The stuff I've done on TikTok, I'm just posting those exact same things on Instagram. It's literally, okay, just copy to Instagram. So it's not seriously done. It's just... Yeah. I'm just throwing them on there at the moment. So... Have you ever been approached by any like other types of media, like TV or books or anything? No, I mean I have done a couple of uh, interviews for TV or things that happened a long time ago. Um, I have to say I've, I've grown up massively in the last year with how I present things and how I can talk about things because you know I always had, I would say that ability. But then once I started watching myself, it was going oh shit, I, you know, I, all the little mannerisms that I have and the little things that I do. I thought. I need to iron that one out. And iron that. No, and no, no, no. Often, um, I I like certain that little. If you were on TV, tips, I thought... yeah, that's I, that. So I I couldn't do it. I always say this to people: I can't be in front of camera. I just can't. I haven't got it. But I think you have. And if what if you've people... got mannerisms and stuff, that's I want to see them. <laughs> what people don't realise, maybe also, is that you know, a lot of people will plan these things. That often, I'm literally I just rock up somewhere. I'll get the camera out and I'll just start talking. And then that's it. And that's done. Or I'm just doing the survey. So, oh, I'm looking at something. So I'll get the camera out, film myself, just talk straight away. Um, very, very little needs to otherwise be done. It all comes out of my head. I've not gone... I often have to check things later on just to make sure I said, I've said that. I, said, I just need to check that fact or something I've said, just in case. But um, that comes with the level of experience and knowledge that I have. Yeah, that's why I know I can. I confidently just talk to people yeah, yeah. about you know what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, or what is this. You know, yeah. Wherever I am, I can talk my <laughs> talk my way through it somehow. Or yeah, but so to, obviously that's my the, the knowledge is is there. Obviously, and people, other people have got knowledge and other things. But talking to camera isn't easy. It isn't. I think yeah, self conscious. You know. It certainly comes in. And I think in the early days, I just wanted to look at myself. You know, I can look at myself on the camera here and I'm checking yeah. myself out. Um, and I think it's because I don't care how I look as well. Yeah. I'm just, this is me. I mean, I've had people comment about the moles or something like this. And <laughs> they'll come up with a, a few things. But, you know, I've had way worse over my life. And I take the piss out of myself. I could, you know, most people yeah. would end up being sort of deprecating if they had my face, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, honestly I just don't care yeah, you know I've, and that... mate, I've had it all right bullying all like taking the piss my mate even your mate to a bad and about and about yours the same yeah so I, being took the piss out of isn't a problem for me but if you look no. um look at any video that i've ever done where it's me talking I'm extremely uncomfortable, and I don't know what it is because I can talk. I can have this conversation with you now, and I can yeah. even write myself a script, and, and so I don't have to remember what I'm going to say. But for some reason, this is why I was said I don't think I'm very charismatic, <laughs> for especially for a camera. It's just not me, well, and I get that. Pretty good comments actually from people that when I've used um, some of the AI voices, they said much prefer listening to your voice because I think I I have a sense of calm. Even when I'm abseiling down yeah, the building yeah. in a dangerous situation, I'm just very matter of fact. Well, yeah. I want to come across as being someone who you can rely on to give you good advice, to yeah. give you the right information. That's what I'm all about, is trying to give people good advice that's free, that they can rely on, that they can then use to better things for themselves, I hope. Yeah. That's it. It's actually that simple. Well, I that's I I use it mainly because I love his, history, and you touch on a lot of history. Mm. But it's really interesting some of the other things you bring up, um, and all that from. I think mm. the first one, the first one I saw was because the TikTok algorithm decided to show me. I think somebody was sealing stone. It was that one, wasn't it? Where that yes. guy, he was saying, <laughs> sealing stone, and then squirting tomorrow to catch up on it. Yeah, and and you got involved. <laughs> To say, um, I, you know, a certain person had pissed me off so much with the following and the fact that he was coming across way too knowledgeable without clearly having any knowledge whatsoever. Yeah. Um, so that's why I went in rather aggressively with that particular one. That's my most aggressive one to date because 
I just needed to, a few people. I think actually, let's wake some people up here with this. This is not on. Not giving this advice that is so wrong. Yeah, so wrong. Yeah, you know, here I am, a nice cheeky chappy kind of. Hey, you know, look what I'm doing. I'm throwing these things and twirling things. Uh, it's just all garbage. It really was garbage. Yeah. The whole. It's a big problem. Social media is for that because, yeah. especially when you're giving people advice. I was As like, I said, they get. Got, I hope that I, actually will, I don't want it to happen, but I almost hope that someone somewhere will sue one of these people when they fall over following advice that they've given, yeah. just to wake them up. Yeah. Um, because is it going to take that accident that some person is injured or even worse, as we could say, um, yeah. because of the bad advice being given by these people who aren't thinking about the bigger picture at all? Yeah. They don't understand all the issues. But they just, you know, are, are salespeople. To me, they're just salespeople in a different, you know, guise. Yeah. It's dangerous. It's it's nuts because it's not, not just the, your world or the tiling world. It's yeah. every fucking aspect of social media has got people giving people advice on yes. various things. And then I admit that not... more recently, I keep getting people on my comments saying, could you do something on this? Because you're one of the few people I think could give an independent view. And yeah. that is exactly what I'm here to do. Well, there, Absolutely, will, there will be people like you in. So you're the, you're the stone guy, as I, I would like. Yeah. In, if someone's bullshitting about stone or, or the building world, probably. Yeah, ask, a lot of people Barry, are now tagging me. Ask Barry to <laughs> fact check it. But there's, a, there's other areas, like, let's say, I don't know, makeup for women or. Um, yeah mountain biking fucking anything there'll be someone claiming to be an expert who's got loads and loads of followers shit loads of followers and so people yeah. are really looking at them thinking they're the expert and there'll be someone else who really is the expert who hasn't got nowhere near the following nowhere there, yeah. because they, they haven't got the, they're probably more like me in front of camera but they're the expert so and it's difficult yeah. to and i do think tiktok is the place that will allow those people to be hurt, do you know I, what I mean? The other places don't. I think the algorithm about still following working. Fucking... Yeah, I, I think the algorithm's working against people like me to a degree because we kind of say something and people are going, "Oh yeah," so they don't comment too much on it. You know, where if someone yeah. says something outrageous, then all of, "Oh no, it is." Oh yes, it is. You, you know, it's yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. Pan, it becomes a pantomime. Yeah. That's what a lot of the big guys are just creating pantomime. Yeah. Um, Whereas I will say something and I'm going, is anyone going to comment on this ever? <laughs> you know? yeah. And I'll always put my own comment in. You'll notice every time I do the first comment just oh, really? to try and see if I can get, just get it going. I never do that. Going. But it's, it's very rare to get a conversation really going. And it's only those times when I introduce something where there is a bit of a grey area that people then will start commenting. So, yeah, that, that is the algorithm, you're right. It's yeah. Looking, it's and looking for interaction. Why, just giving information is so difficult on TikTok, and I've spotted it with the other creators, some good creators out there, giving some great bits of advice or history or certain things, and they're just not getting the traffic because people are looking at going, oh, that was nice. I think it'll you change. Know. I think they'll change the algorithm. I hope so. Do you know why I think? Because obviously you can do 10-minute videos now. I'm pretty sure you can do like one-hour videos on TikTok. I, I think it's gone up to an hour, yes. Yeah. So there's no way they'd let you make an hour video and then punish you with the algorithm. That I yeah, think, I'm going to try that out soon. <laughs> yeah, I think they're working towards streaming because they're, mm. they're obviously. I don't even think they're. They obviously are, but their main competitor to their main competitors in my eyes is like Netflix. Yeah, and, and the, the other social media companies, they're not even doing the same thing. It kind of looks like the same thing, but I don't think they are. So them. That, so they upped it to an hour, but you can also upload things on um, landscape. So I'm like, well, why the fuck does TikTok want landscape? People flick for yes, it. Yes, I yeah. think they're. I think they're preparing for streaming. Yeah, I they're, mean, I tried the landscape thing out a couple of times, and it just got nowhere. So I'm leaving that alone. They're for warming the up for streaming because when you stream a landscape to the TV, obviously. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You need it. I think that's what they're testing. The testing. Yeah. What does it look like? Do people interact with it? Do people watch it for an hour if it's an hour long? And I think people will definitely. Somebody put yeah. a basket. Somebody put the other day. I would. I didn't watch it, but it was curious. A full length basketball match from like nineteen eighty nine or something. The championships of the. Um, yeah. What's it called? The um, NBA. So NBA, the, the, yeah. the NBA finals of nineteen eighty nine. So it's supposed to be a classic game. 
hmm. and fucking millions of people watched it all the way through. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm pres- I don't know if you can stream it or not yet, but that's the kind of thing that TikTok's looking. Do yeah. people want to Why send not? that to their TV? So I think that'll be the future for TikTok. And I think you're well placed because you're going to have a good library of documentary well, so. style you know, information. But it's going to be there as a, to me, a resource that I want to be the person that they go, you know what, I'm going to be doing something. Oh, there's that guy. Go on this site and they'll find yeah. more easily the information. Because at the moment, it's just loads and loads of posts on what seemingly random stuff as I come across it. That's why I need to get it yeah. properly sectioned into all I'd these I'd like you to areas. make a documentary about the history of your area, but in this country with various yeah. buildings like where, where it progressed through oh, thousands of years. I'd love that. Crazy stuff years, yeah. Do it. Do it. Start making it. I'll watch it. So, um, <laughs> away from work, tell me about you've told me about a place that you've got an island. I want you to tell me about that. Is that your hobby or just another job? Yeah, I'll be there in a couple of weeks. Well, actually just over a week's time. Um, in 90... Well, when were we talking about? So, yeah, just at the end of uh, the last millennium, my auntie moved to Ireland and I started going over to Ireland regularly to see her and started travelling around from where she lived in sort of Cork Waterford borders down in the south. And I always was going and looking at castles and other sort of ancient sites because Ireland is packed with them. And I do have some Irish blood in the family back in the day. Um, like everyone's going to always say they're Irish somewhere. <laughs> um, mine's only three generations, so not so bad as a lot of uh, other people from other countries I could, could mention. Anyway, um, but my auntie had married an Irishman, so you know we got a pretty good connection there. That's why she was living in Ireland. Um, and having visited there, my wife had already said that she always wanted to live either by a castle or by water, but, you know, like a river or something. Yeah. And on one of these trips, we went to this castle, which we couldn't get to and had to go through this plot of land to get round to some steps to get up to the castle. And this was this water mill. Um, and we went past it, went to the castle, did a, came back and said, well, isn't this a pretty place? Because there's a medieval bridge that runs over the river there, the weir. And the, the whole setting is absolutely spectacular. And she saw there was a for sale sign on it. So we made our inquiries back in 2014. It took us two and a half, almost three years to secure the sale. Um, doggedly, we stuck in there. I changed all my money into euros for the sale the two days before Brexit vote happened. So if I hadn't, I'd have had to have paid another 70 or 80,000 pounds for wow. the property. That's the difference. I made the night of the Brexit vote, I effectively made. I think it was eighty-five thousand pounds in one night from the exchange rate of, that, of what I had. Done. What happened? What was the details of the exchange rate? Though? I don't. I... Well, because it was at that time, it was for a pound you'd get one euro thirty-five. That's uh-huh. what I got it at. Yeah. Um, after the vote, it went down to one euro twelve. Wow. So you had it was like fifteen twenty percent drop yeah. in the rate. So paying out three hundred and something thousand for yeah, the yeah. mill. I mean, at the end of the day, I've got two acres of land. Uh, upstairs, there was 11 bedrooms and big ones as well. Downstairs, there are loads of other rooms and outbuildings as well. Um, but that costs roughly the same as um, a very small one-bedroom flat in London. Yeah. You know, to me, yes, everything was ruined. I needed a new roof. You know, it's a shell of a place. But to me, potential. So I've, since 2017, um, been I've put the roof basically reslated the main roofs. There were four big roofs that I redid myself with a, a young lad I know. Um, and we've just carried on from there, just redoing anything and everything we can within reason. Uh, we've had to run the gauntlet of the locals a few times as well. Um, yeah, it's been a bit of a journey, the whole story there. But, you know, they understand that I'm actually trying to get it back to a way, in a way that it was, because... It's a feature of the whole village that I'm in. It's their sort of one of their pride and joy by the castle. It's a beautiful uh, place. And, you know, I've just allowed the local community to erect a whole range of signs along the river on the property for the kids to come along so they can read about different aspects of it. So there's a nice trail cool. that's just gone in um, this last week. You know, got to help the community in all sorts of ways. But initially, I did have all the problems of being a the Englishman coming from the outside, apart from me being the only 
Englishman in my family, effectively. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get that. Just because I was yeah. kind of born and brought up here, but the rest of my family is from all over the place. You yeah, know? I can relate. I moved to Kilkenny when I was in it. I was I wasn't a man. I was I was English though, so I know what they're like. Yeah, it takes a but, while. Yeah, you know, I just say to people, look, why on earth would I be here if I didn't love the place? Yeah, it's as simple as that. And I absolutely adore place. I, I do love the way of life. I, I there's a lot of in, living in London in particular that just pisses me off at the end of the day. <laughs> and I wish, you know, I've got to that time in my life where there are other things which um, you know are much more important to me. Which is just my plan is to open a sculpture school and to create what I'm going to call the River of Time. So the idea is to get giant blocks of stone from all over Ireland, representing the geology of Ireland through wow. the geological them and place them up the river which i can do because they're not permanent erections as it were they are big lumps of stone being dumped and then carving them into different themes of irish folklore or history wow. and inviting artists down to come and carve irish mythology well. is like the best this is this is just like a, a whole retirement scheme planned out for me that i can spend the rest of my days just tinkering with and getting people in to enjoy to the whole point was they thought I was going to stop people from visiting the castle and the mill, um, you know, and that beautiful area. But my view was always the opposite to try and get people in to get a love for what I love. Yeah. Um, and to, I would love school groups to be coming through the property to take in the different types of rocks and yeah. to understand and get that side of things, you know, just that's perfect for me as a, say, a retirement idea. But that's going to be 15 years in the making, probably. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. So that is that your basically your spare time at the moment? Yeah, the spare time is I'm still even you know after the seven years I still don't actually have electric electricity in the mill, so everything's run off generators and things like that, or you know just good old fashioned hand tools, everything as well. <laughs> but I've done are a you, lot. Are you documenting it? I have been, but with badly, I'd say. But now. The, a number of my posts over the last year have put stuff on the mill of the things that I've been doing. So, is it the same uh, account? Yes. I oh yeah. I haven't seen it. If you flick through anything with a brown, you'll, you'll notice I've color coded my different posts. <laughs> Something that again most people might not notice, but yeah. again I've color coded things, so all the things on the mill are in brown with the the, the little yeah, square. Yeah. The you go icons. In. Yeah. So it's quick to go and spot the ones that are about the mill. Ah, uh, cool. So I, I usually ask people for advice if um, how did they get into doing what you do. So obviously yours would be going to geology at university. Yeah. But what if someone is a little bit older? Uh, let's say they're a tradesman at the moment, but they're quite interested in the same things that you are, and they'd like to become. Um, yeah, it's what... tricky because I've had to develop such a massive background of knowledge. Yeah. You know, which was on the job training with a consultancy and just jobs coming in through the door and going you know what well we just crack on and have a go and yeah. learning as we went but using your wits from what you know to help solve the things and yeah um i'd say you desperately do need someone like i had mentors who started me off and absolutely 100 percent. there's a couple of guys i could talk about at great length who gave me such great initial knowledge in certain areas which got me going and so it would be difficult really to get into the level that I'm doing the way that I'm doing things. However, there are many aspects such as, for example, the abseiling of people quite regularly say, well, how did you get into this? How do you, you know, start doing the rope access? And a number of them, I've, I've, I said, just privately, you know, direct message me and we'll just chat a bit more and I'll give them a bit of information about the things out there. And uh, yeah, there's um, some easy ways into some quite good parts of the industry especially with the rope access, if you've got the head for heights, for example. So yeah. if you're a tradesperson who wants a bit more of a, a bit more fun, then there's so many things that if you know how to use your hands, there are, there's lots of people crying out for good tradespeople. Um, yeah. Go and, go and learn some abseiling and uh, fix some roofs. It's a combination of having a trade and doing rope. There's only a couple of uh, stonemasons who abseil, but they both rush... Or run off their feet with work yeah. because they are so rare but 
the cost of putting a scaffolding up versus a little job where you can get a guy to abseil down to it and do all the masonry work and install something, off they go. And that's what we do at the Bank of England. With little things that crop up, we get an abseiling mason in to sort them out. Wow. Therefore, we're not spending thousands upon thousands of scaffolding. To close a road in some major parts of London will cost you five thousand pounds an hour in yeah, some locations. i saw that that so you it was a it was a small street no, i mean that, i did the little side that, street just that that, yeah. that was the really low cost one but it's still a cost quite a costly yeah, for the street that in. no one uses oh but to put scaffolding, up, a day. scaffolding license for certain things can be quite cheap in some areas but can be really expensive in other it's just you know and if you do need road closures um that's when the costs escalate yeah so yeah, that's why abseiling has come a long way, especially in the cities, because of the licenses and their costs. Yeah. And being able to do stuff discreetly, easily and quickly. What did you do for the Queen? Uh, that was the, There was an installation of a whole load of uh, natural stone in Buckingham Palace. You know when they opened up the museum area. So all of those areas, some of the stones in there had uh, problems and literally fell apart. So I went in and it was a stone I'd seen do exactly that about 20 years previously. Um, I won't go into any more details than that, but uh, it was a case of, well, you've used this stone in this environment and this is what happens. It was a, a calcium sulfate reaction. Calcium sulfate is anhydrite, uh, but if you add water to it, it becomes gypsum and that's quite an expensive reaction. And that's what was happening is calcium sulfate within the limestone they'd used was hydrating and uh, then forcing the stone apart along certain veins, just splitting the stone open. Not what you want to do when you've got great big skirtings and things, um, which have cost you you a thousand pounds a meter or whatever. (laughs) Uh, So that sort of stuff, I mean, I can just go on and on and on about the things that I've had to go and do and look at over the years of so many different examples of different crazy things that happen. But that's why I give knowledge, which is pretty well rounded now, yeah. because of that experience. Yeah. Well, it's really good, mate. And your TikTok is Stone Guru. If people want to follow you, so you can get to ten thousand yeah, followers. <laughs> I don't think ten thousand people listen to this episode, but let's hope they do. And let if they all follow you, that's it. Happy days. We get a library from from you. The thing is, is that I said to someone the other day, I said, look, I'm not pretty. I'm not anything particular. I'm just <laughs> presenting on stuff that I'm quite passionate about, that I know about. Yeah. I think in the space of just a year, I've done pretty well from having no media of any form to get to now just on coming up to 6,000 uh, people. And they're getting quite um, protective as well. There are a lot of them when people Fans. make odd comments are now defending. So this yeah. guy knows his stuff, which is really nice. Fanboys. To see, you know, that they, yeah. they're now understanding where I'm coming from. Well, it's point. quite funny when, because like, you might come across as arrogant. I don't mean, I don't mean you do, but you might. Absolutely, one hundred percent. I know that's you, the problem. But it's not. Like, it's not arrogance. It's just somebody quoting facts to someone yes. else who doesn't really know what Absolutely. they're on about. So, it, so they start thinking that you're arrogant, or but it's because... not. It's just very blunt. Factual information. Someone will say something. I'll just go, "No, you're wrong." Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) and why you're wrong? And then they don't believe me. And then they'll that this is when they go away. They're just desperate to kind of one up you all the time. Yeah, and that uh, usually I just say to them, "Look, I'm not interested in you know just take either take it or leave it." But occasionally, as I said, sometimes I just want to try and twist someone who gets really uptight around to say, "Look, actually, you are speaking to someone who is an expert." and the, there was a post I did on what is an expert. I don't know if you saw that one. No. Uh, look it up where I actually show all my certificates of my <laughs> geology degree, my master's degree. And I put them all up there. The fact that I'm a chartered surveyor, chartered builder, chartered scientist, chartered geologist. And I go through all these things. And uh, the guy who tried to call me out was someone who had over 100,000 following, who was a painter decorator. And he got real, the real ass with me, and he was saying I was being nasty. And it was like, well, I'm just explaining the facts of the situation. Yeah. I know what I'm talking about. That's a problem, yeah. <laughs> it's, I don't think you are arsey, but I've, I've, I can see where, why some people would <laughs> Absolutely. think that. Absolutely. I've, I've, 
I fully respect that. And I quite often say to people, I say, look, I will come across as arrogant, but all I'm trying to do is cut through all the BS. Yeah, it's very unlikely I, that there'll be anybody me, who can challenge you in your area. That's why there will be, and I'm, I'm sure you'd welcome oh, yeah. it. But I actually I wouldn't try it. <laughs> enjoy it when someone that comes up with some really good arguments. Yeah. And sometimes I'll go, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. But then I'll go through the work, the process, and go, ultimately, yeah, now you, you've brought that point in it's either got a positive or a negative to it uh, there will yeah. always be something else that i will then think of and you know you've always got to have people that will you, again don't be that echo chamber that you think you're right all the time yeah that take everything seriously but there's there are those people that are clearly not serious then i can't be bothered with that yeah. but um yeah but sometimes the people i'm taking seriously don't understand that they think I'm being rude or something or um, winding them up. But uh, yeah. no, it's just being direct. With it's that. tricking it. The thing is, sometimes people, I don't get this, right? So if I don't know something or if I know I'm not an expert in something, I'll just genuinely say, I, I don't know. I'm not an expert in it. I don't know. I can give you yeah. some experience. Some people are like, like me. They don't know. They're not an expert in it. But for some reason, they think they do know. And I'm like, Oh, yeah. But like, yeah. why are you arguing with someone who obviously knows what they're on about? Why don't you just talk to them instead and learn something? <laughs> yeah. And I just you don't know, get once it. people talk to me, then I, I'm absolutely. Um, if you ever go through any of my posts and go through the comments, if you want to read through the comments, you'll see I absolutely, almost to a team, nearly everyone gets a response from me of some form or another. Yeah. And anything of any sort of interest will often, will there'll be a conversation there to, to look at in the comments yeah. of extra information. And then I will then think of another post to do because it's sparked something. I thought that is an interesting point of view. So yeah. let's look into it and do something on it. Yeah. Very good. I'm, I would say I'm possibly one of the most interactive people out there because I am genuinely interested in always trying to give the right information and improving myself at the same time. Yeah. It's, to me, that's the goal, you know. Well, I like it. And hopefully you get to the 10,000 <laughs> followers. We it's, don't make... it's certainly a different, I think I'm giving a quite different TikTok experience to the, 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 the norm. Yeah. So like I say, I, I think you're getting closer to some, it, it'll either be something else that TikTok also does that's more like watching TV like a TV show with longer yeah. form information or entertainment and it and it'll run alongside the old stuff as well as the shopping stuff yeah, they need to shopping. split it up they need to split it up to, yes the shopping stuff isn't is too intertwined with the normal stuff at the moment and i think How they will split it up try to not interested in Lemnor adverts yeah whatever. i think they'll split it up they'll learn <laughs> that people it pisses people off but this they are very desperate they they're very I think it's the Chinese way. It it seems like yeah, like very aggressive desperation to shove something in your face so you'll buy it, and it obviously it might work for them. Yeah, but it, it, it tends to be like impulse mm. buys or. The, no, I'm not here for one thing about me is my stuff. I'm not selling anything. I'm yeah. just selling. Um, absolutely nothing i'm not recommending anyone if i think something's good i'll just say that's good I, there's no trying to be getting some sort of fee for it or anything like that mm -hmm. it's because i genuinely think it's actually the right product to use if yeah. i ever say anything like that so yeah i did an experiment one of the other guests was a tyler and i was telling him about this it was when the shop was quite new actually and i did an experiment and i ended up making like 195 quid just through taking a piss with him so I was like, I've or I already had this shaver. It's like a mini fucking clipper blade. I was like, they sell them on a TikTok shop. I'm just gonna do a video of me having a shave, and I did, and it made 195 pound in like two days, and like, fuck. <laughs> but also within the comments, there was loads of people taking the yeah. piss out of my appearance, and it's like, this is fucking yeah. horrendous. If I was like, not as. If I was someone who actually got bothered about things like that, fuck me, it must be horrible mm. for some people. So, yeah. I think we're done, mate. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate well, thank it. Thank you for inviting me on, so... No problem. Is there anything you want to end it with to let people know about anything that you're doing or give them a message? No, um, other than... I mean, I've said it time and time again, really. I just want to get to this magical 10,000 mark on TikTok so I can give a better service to people. It's as simple as that. That 
the information that I want to try and share, mm -hmm. which I really wish people could understand that there is a resource coming right in front of them that so few people will just look at maybe one of my things and think, oh, that's not of any interest to me and not realize at all what's behind it all and why it's there. And that one day they might be able to save loads of money by just the tip that I've given. <laughs> yeah. You know, or not fall into the trap of some bad bit of business with uh, an unscrupulous supplier of uh, some sort of landscaping or whatever. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it'll be there as a library, unless they ban, unless they do actually ban TikTok one day. Uh, Happy yeah. days. Then what will we do? <laughs> I don't think they'll ban it. Rethink. Yeah. yeah. All right, mate. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah, it. Well, thank you too. I really appreciate it. You're an interesting guy. Oh, thank it's, you. It's uh, intimidating for me to think about talking to because I knew you, how knowledgeable you were about stuff so I'm like fuck <laughs> what do I even <laughs> say what do I ask so I, I, I appreciate it on for days. I mean we're, we're literally scratching the surface of the stuff that I've done over the years but you know that's the nature of things but I've got a lot of stuff ultimately I want to try and get out there but yeah yeah come do it again do it again <laughs> mate well come back on and right. when you've got uh, when you've done something with your uh, mill or yeah you, or your tiktok account or something come back on tell us about it and then tell us a few more stories absolutely will do <laughs> thank you very much all right thank you cheers again. mate thank you bye-bye bye-bye bye everybody